Thanks. We'll start over again since the mic wasn't on. Thank you, AGC. Uh, good evening. This is the regular meeting of the Harbor Advisory Board. Uh, it's Thursday, November 1, 2018. We're in the Veterans Memorial Building here in Morro Bay. And uh, all of the board is present this evening, so we have a quorum. And we'll call the meeting to order. And we'll have a moment of silence, please. We have plenty of cause in the country for that. Thank you. So the Pledge of Allegiance. Therese, you want to lead us off? So the next agenda item is chair, advisory board member, and liaison announcements and presentations. So we'll begin um, liaison Councilman Makowetsky, do you have anything for this this evening? Okay. Sharice? Okay. Dana? Yes, I do have uh, an article from the log, a body magazine, Southern California mostly. It's about a federal study by the Commerce Department of outdoor recreational activities, and the largest being uh, boating. And so it was $36.9 billion for boating and fishing. Uh, the other categories were golfing, tennis, et cetera. Uh, next was RVing. Next was guided tours and travel, and uh, concerts, festivals, and sports motorcycling and ATVing and uh, so I thought that was something we should you know that I should bring bring up since I read this article uh, mostly uh, just has to do with marine activities being the so that was descending order of gross correct. revenue correct oh. starting from 36.9 billion was boating and fishing going all the way down to uh, one, two, three, four, fifth category down from there was 20.2 billion for motorcycling and ATVing. Now these all have a little bit of fringe things that go along with those, you know, apparel and all the way down to, uh, you know, from construction to, to and design to uh, actual activities um, and accessories. What was the approximate percentage of that two category? Uh, total, well, of all of these, right. it was 2.2 percent of the current uh, GDP um, for uh, was represented by the recreational uh, economy. How many billions total? 412 billion. And and boating was 30. Four, about 40. 40. 36.9. So 10 percent, if I did that correctly. Yeah, pretty good. Wow. Wow. Anyways, buy a boat. <laughs> oh yeah, unless there's only three of us doing it, it costs really a lot of money. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of fishing lures. Sure. Mark? Nothing at this time. Lynn? Nothing. Thank you. Jeremiah? Yeah, I, I don't have anything except for the wind issue, and we'll be doing that later, I think. Is okay. Correct. Gene? Oh, uh, I see the pelicans are in the bay. State of the bay, Gene. Yeah, if, if state of the bay. If you happen to go by my little old barge, it is covered thick with pelican stuff. They must be an inch and a half thick at this point. I use a square shovel to get rid of it. Um, um, but on that same note, there's lots of pelicans and pigeons in the bay. Um, and pigeons are, are just making a mess on all the boats. I talked to um, a friend of mine down in Newport Beach where they have a crow, pelican, and seagull patrol where they use green laser lights to shine on those birds and then the birds all fly away and they've kept most of the birds off of boats. So that was kind of interesting. So, Wow. Lynn. Do they stay off permanently? Well, after as long as there's somebody shining a light on them, they don't oh, think well. they go away. <laughs> no, but they don't seem to come back. It's so, I mean, a full-time job for each bird. <laughs> well, now, apparently, it seems to be working pretty good down in Newport. So huh. I got my pointer out there this morning, and I uh -huh. tried it, and it seemed to work. So, One at each corner? 
coming to the center? No, <laughs> laser light. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah right. I mean. So, Gene, how many how many white pelicans? How many browns? Oh, uh, gee, I don't know. I mean, you but see, the, white? the white pelicans are really cool because they all kind of go together as a team, and then we'll round up anchovies together, and then one will go in, kind of like whales will do, where the brown pelicans. You know, when a brown pelican dies and hits the water, he knocks himself out. <laughs> and, and but instinct means he's got to open his mouth to get something to eat. You know? Interesting. What did you say, Dana? I said they blind. They blind themselves. Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Wow. There's a factoid. Yeah. They'll. Uh, wow. I've known people that have witnessed them diving on potholes. Oh. Wow. So they, you know the, the black tar. You know they'll spot the tar, so they're blind. They spot the tar and uh, dive on the potholes. See a black spot. It's like oh boy, anchovies. Oh gosh. But it's been really pretty on the bay the last week or so. It's just gorgeous out there. Best time of the year. So. Okay, and I have nothing. So that brings us to public comment. Public comment for anything that is either not on the agenda or for which the public cannot stay. Uh, we don't have any um, warm body attendance this evening, so I think we'll move right through that one. And that takes us to item A1, which is uh, approval of the minutes from the Harbor Advisory Board meeting held on September 6, 2018. Do we have any review comments, corrections, or additions from the board? Seeing none, a motion to approve. So moved. Okay, Lori, just pick somebody. Everybody. <laughs> uh, any, any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None? Carries. And that brings us to B1, which is the Harbor Department Status Report. Director Endersby. Thank you very much. Um, to my we've got the usual items on here, and we've also got a pretty long laundry list of other things to update on that we wanted to get you up to date on. So we'll start at the top of the usual patrol statistics. Um, Last month or so, 11 emergency responses, 80 calls for service, um, good number of assist of other agencies, some enforcement contacts, weather warnings. Um, I think all of our emergency respondents responses ended in relatively good order, which is good. And the weather starting up, as, as Gene usually announces, uh, you know, winter is, is starting to show up and we've got our great fall warm weather. It sure doesn't seem like it, but um, any time we'll start getting swells and hopefully some storms and winds, so <clears throat> just be aware of that. Um, our lifeguards, although technically our season ended with Harborfest weekend, we from Labor Day to Harborfest weekend, we we staff our towers on weekends only, and then um, after that weekend, we're pretty well done. Although there's been a number of events where our guards have been called out back to service. One was Operation Surf, which is a wounded warrior veterans program, the great program that was out on the beach for a weekend um, back on the 13th and 14th, um, on the 21st. Um, Scholastic Surf Series had a surf contest at the Rock that we had guards in the beach for. And then we've got the Morby Triathlon coming up this weekend on Sunday. We'll have uh, personnel out there in the water keeping track on that. And a WSA surf contest on November 10th and 11th. So our lifeguards off duty, but they're still fairly busy. Um, lifeguard towers were removed from the beach um, as part of the Dyni-G pipeline removal project, which I'll go into a little bit uh, more on here in a second. Um, our towers, typically, we drag them off with our city's heavy equipment, but Dynagy, um, bless their hearts, they had all their equipment out there for doing their pipeline projects, so when they were done with that, they towed our towers off the beach for us. Um, project went fairly well. Um, as you know, there were, there, or may know, there were three sections to that pipeline to be removed. There was the ocean section, the, the stuff out in the water, that some of which was buried, some of it not. The section through the surf line that was buried <clears throat> they built a pier and a coffer dam to originally um, in the 50s to bury that pipeline and it was 15 to 18 feet under the sand when buried, probably 20 feet now, through the surf line up into the beach and then about halfway up the beach it, it came up towards the surface, it was maybe 8 or 10 feet below and then off into the dunes. Uh, they got all the pipeline out of the offshore element going up to the surf line until it got to be maybe 6, 8 feet deep as it started to dive into the, into the sand through the surf line. They got the stuff off the beach from as far as they could get to the, to the wet surf line up to the dunes um, where the pipeline heads off into the power plant and got all that pipeline out. 
they never intended to remove the pipeline from the dunes back to the plant. They figured just leave that in place rather than dig it all up and disturb everything. They pumped it full of concrete. Surfline section, they couldn't get out. They had a um, large piece of machinery that pounded it from the beach side. I forget how many millions of pounds of pressure. It was basically a giant battering ram, hydraulic battering, or pneumatic battering ram that pounded on the pipe. And then on the other end, they hooked onto it in the ocean and pulled on it with, I forget, 237,000 pounds of pulling force or something. And as, as they were pulling on it, and it was apparently not moving, some, something snapped out on the outer um, barge part of it. A piece of cable snapped on it, so they figured that's it, they're done before they kill anybody trying to pull the pipeline out, and they decided to just leave it in place. So it's in place, it's deep under the sand, will probably never ever surface, but um, so other than that, it went fairly well. They did uncover <coughs> one Native American bone during the process, somewhere in the, in the area of that swamp. Two, no, there was an animal bone. The second one was an animal bone. Um, curiously enough, when I started back in the early 90s here, um, I remember a Native American bone washing up on the beach during some winter storm event. You know, the creek got exposed. And Jim Kroll, who retired here about uh, 10 years ago now, um, remembered when that occurred that that bone had exposed itself about 10 years prior to that. It, and the, the Natives tried to repatriate it back more or less where it came from. And so when it, you know, when it showed up, 25 odd years ago, they sent it back up Morrow Creek and buried it, um, and then it showed up again. The guy that, that ended up repatriating it recognized it because he was the guy that reburied it the last time, so we went and reburied it again. Um, and then this bone showed up, and I, while I don't remember seeing the bone from 20 odd years ago, it was an upper arm bone, which was the same bone that was the one before, so it may be the same one that showed up again. Uh, they're now putting it on, the, the Chumash and the Selenians have teamed up and they're going to put it up on power plant property somewhere, so it won't be in the creek anymore, so hopefully it won't show up anymore. So kind of an interesting uh, turn of events on that one. It slowed them down for a couple of weeks um, as they investigated. The, the process is it goes to the um, county coroner and they determine if it's ancient or modern. Um, obviously if it's modern and it becomes a crime scene and, and all that stuff starts to happen. Unfortunately it wasn't, it was ancient. Um, then they got back to work. They had the, the pipeline that went through, I call it the swamp, um, the, the, uh, the, what else would you call it? The estuary <laughs> where the creek is that doesn't have any water flowing in. Um, they had a number, a good population of tidewater gobies in there that they had to kind of herd out of the way. And, and apparently there's, and I haven't gotten the report yet, maybe I'll bring December from Dynasty, they're going to give me the report of all the fish species in there. They say there were flounder in there. I, yeah, there's a whole bunch of different kind of fish in there in that relatively stagnant pond. So again, everything went okay. They got our equipment off the beach, cleaned it back up. Uh, you know, one swell and a little bit of wind and you'll never even know they're there. And I just want to thank Dinegy again for helping us remove our towers. They were great at taking care of all that and cleaning up. The, I think they graded the parking lot out at the end of the dirt road too. So that project's all done. Reserve Harbor Patrol Officer Matt Horn went to a rescue boat training course down in Los Angeles um, a couple of weeks ago. He also is going to be attending a Marine firefighting class in November. Uh, we typically try to send all of our personnel, including reserves, to at least three courses that Boating and Waterways puts on, basic um, safety and enforcement, rescue boat operations, and marine firefighting. They offer about six different courses, some of which are things we'd probably never use. Um, so we don't tend to send our folks to those, but the core ones we do send all of our folks to as much as we can. Any questions on any of those? Yes. Did they carbon date the bone? I don't know. I will ask. <clears throat> Recent council activity on October 9th, um, council adopted a resolution um, Approving conditional use permit for Harbor Work Plaza, um, 833 Embarcadero, and that's um, what used to be Off the Hook Restaurant to TLC Family Enterprises. Um, that was the you know, basically the concept plan approval for their plan to redevelop that lease site that went through Planning Commission back in, I want to say October, early October. Or no, I'm sorry, August. Um, and also extended their interim lease, which was set to expire in October. So um, we'll be working with that leaseholder on a new lease, and we'll see... Um, try and get that to the council in December for approval of that lease and they continue on with that project. Then October 23rd, the council adopted a resolution um, 
putting in a new general fund emergency reserve policy, internal service funds policy, and the harbor accumulation fund emergency, uh, not emergency, harbor accumulation fund reserve policy um, that we looked at here a couple meetings ago and we're looking at a little bit more tonight, um, including a TBID improvement district policy. Um, so we're looking at trying to figure out how to fund that and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And also on October 23rd, the council approved a couple more amendments for the boat yard lease site, um, which is not the boat yard, boat yard that lifts boats out, but the boat yard between Off the Hook and Otter Rock. And um, another lease amendment for the Otter Rock lease site based on our continuing saga of that seawall failure and trying to mitigate and negotiate with that leaseholder to um, get that project underway. As it is now, the city has to have all the permits issued building permits issued by November 23rd. It's looking like we'll get there. Um, they're in escrow for the Otter Rock lease site as well that is about ready to close. Um, the leaseholder there has already got Associated Pacific under contract to start bringing, ordering parts and materials to do the seawall repair. So knock on wood, um, if the creeks don't rise, we'll see that project get underway sometime this winter, hopefully in December, maybe January. Any questions on any of those? Yeah, the what? conceptual plan for the conditional use like, permit. Oh. Conceptual plan for the conditional use permit. Are there a series of conditions for that? Oh yeah. Is I, it public at this point or no? It's yeah. You could where you could find it is probably go to the city council um, city council agenda um, for October twenty third and look up the item and the item should have all the attachments. To that conditional use permit and the plans and everything that goes along with it. And what is the term of the extension for the short term lease? Uh, we extend it to December 11th. It was set to expire, I want to say, October 25th. <clears throat> the reason was that we, we, we keyed off the original dates off of a starting point earlier this year, and by no fault of the leaseholder, it took longer for the city to get them to planning commission for the concept approval and then get to the City Council for concept approval, so that pushed everything back further. So that's why the new date. Anything else? Regarding the resolution 8518, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 8518, which rescinded 3315. What are the Harbor Department's requirements that are embedded in that resolution, if any, specific to the Harbor Department? <clears throat> well, the resolution basically approves the conditional use permit and all the no 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 oh i'm sorry no 8518 oh i'm on the wrong one ask your question again please Ron. sure are there specific requirements relative to the harbor department that are embedded in resolution 8518 i do not believe so it's just re establishing that reserve policy, the harbor fund, okay. harbor accumulation fund reserve policy. The requirements are going to be figure out. I mean, my marching orders are to work with finance and, and I have been trying to figure out a way to fund it. Well, go ahead, Mark. Is there a number to the it? Is there a what? A number to the it. Is there a number in a rate that they're looking to, that the resolution dictates? The policy, the policy itself sets a target of 15% of our operating budget for starters to establish a reserve fund with an ultimate target of, of I believe, 25%. And the current operating budget is? $2 million. Okay. And the so number? So 15% of $2 million. Oh, I'll find it because in my staff report, I'm not going to do math in public. 15% is about 250,000. Right. And 417 is the the target 25%. Right. And, and the and the reason I think we're asking is because if there's as we are asking ourselves <clears throat> what ideas can we come up with and you're asking us for ideas so we're trying to get a, sort of the size of the child you know the magnitude of the thing. So basically basically quarter million my mic's on. And I, we'll be touching on that in the staff. So basically, yeah, I understand. So basically a quarter million dollars. Yep. Okay. Over three years. Right. Over three years, correct. 
Okay, upcoming events. We've got two tall ships coming, Lady Washington and Hawaiian Chieftain, coming November 28th, staying through December 18th, so a nice good long stay. They're going to be staying at the South Deep here this time. And I believe they'll also be participating in the Lighted Boat Parade, which is December 1st. It's first Saturday, and the first Saturday is the first this year. Uh, they're having cash prizes for best decorated boats, um, other prizes, um, some information there, and, and who to contact if you're interested in getting in the Lighted Boat Parade. It's being sponsored by Morbay Rotary once again. Um, great event as it usually is. Hopefully we won't have to delay for rain. Uh, although it would be nice to have some rain, but just not that night. And this year, um, as opposed to past years, we're, while everyone's getting numbers to be judged on, we're not going to attempt to line anybody up in a certain order as we've always done in the past because it, it just it becomes a nightmare trying to herd all those cats and get them in the right order. So just everybody's got a number, and as they go by the judging booth or the judging place, they'll be able to see their number and go from there. So hopefully that will make things run a little bit smoother because it, it's an awful hectic 45 minutes trying to get all those boats lined up. We'll put a first few in order, and it's going to be a little tricky figuring out how to get the tall ships in. Um, we're, we're asking everybody to go past the Narrows at Target Rock and then turn around at the, you know, kind of inside the North Jetty where it opens up a little bit more because in recent years, the um, you know, a fair amount of people will turn around at Coleman, a fair amount of people will turn around maybe a little before Target Rock, and man, there's a ton of people lining that whole waterfront all the way out to the rock and even on the south side parking lot. So we're going to try and get everybody to go out a little further. Tall ships are going to be a little trickier because they don't maneuver very well. So we'll have to figure out how to weave them in. But they intend, when you said participate, they intend to follow the path, the parade they path? They intend to get in the parade. I, what may, the best we may be able to do is get them to go down to Tidelands Park earlier in the day. And then when everybody heads off, maybe they can pull out in front of everybody and get going. Um, but... It's going to be a challenge. Those big boats don't maneuver well. Do you know what the tide's doing? The tide is high. It's a 4.0 high at 5.35, 5.40 or something. Um, and then it's going out at 11.30 to 0 0.6. So it's going out a little less than four feet. So not a big change, but going out. Um, so at least it's high. Our, our biggest problem is always a low tide or an outgoing tide um, and boats having to jockey into the tide out in front of the launch ramp and then turn around and head down downstream to get around the corner. So this year, will, um, not a huge tide change, so hopefully we have a good time. The, the parade starts at 6, so you know it's right after the tide change that, that um, the parade starts. So hopefully it won't be too much mayhem. And before we leave that item, specifically how do boat owners register? Or do they need to register? Can they just show yep, up? Yep, you need to register. You sign up, uh, Moore Bay Rotary. You can contact Terry. Looking, I mean, look on our staff report for, for tonight. But you can contact Terry Bayus at eight zero five three zero five zero five seven nine, or email her at Terry Bayus T E R I B A Y U S at gmail dot com. Um, you can also go to www.morobaywinterfest.com dot com, or if you know anybody that's in Rotary, contact somebody in the Rotary Club. Thank you. Or come to our office. I have one more question on that. Um, the judging last year was off the public dock um, between Roses, yeah, just north of Roses right there, that cul-de-sac. Is that where it's going to be again? Okay. Yep. Down by the chessboard in the Santa house. Okay. Anything else on those? Okay, now we come to the status of multiple items. Um, Beach Street Slips Project. Um, basic engineering and design layout is completed on that. At this point, we've got concrete, concrete docks and piling specified, although that may be being under review here shortly. Um, one thing with going to concrete docks and pilings, it reduces the number of pilings. Um, the problem with it is it rearranges where they are, which could be an eelgrass problem because there's a lot of eelgrass around there. Um, on the north set of slips, if you're familiar with it, there's a little walkout pier that goes out maybe 20, 25 feet and then hits the gangway going on down. We're proposing to get rid of that walkway 
and just go to one long gangway, which will reduce, number one, will take a bunch of pilings out of the water and be less structure in the water. And number two, it reduces the slope, give us a much mellower slope getting out to the slips. On the south slips, um, if any of you have, have walked down that cliff of a gangway, um, we're proposing to reconfigure that gangway as well to run it a little more diagonally. You will kind of head towards the south tee pier and, and hit the dock head float at an angle. It will reduce the angle. Um, it'll still be on low tides, a little on the steep side, but there's not a lot we can do. There's not much room to work with, but we're going to try and um, mellow up that slope as much as we can. And then another negative of the project is the electrical service to both set of the slips is inadequate and there's really no good way to upgrade it. All the conduits are now underneath the boardwalk, buried. Um, and there's, we've had electricians look at it and there's no good way to pull the conduits out and, and get new service back through there. So we're going to have to pull all new service in. It'll come from the middle of the street um, towards the kite shop, which is where there's a, an underground drop box in there somewhere. We can pull from PG&E and come across the street. So that's going to add cost to it, unfortunately. Um, there's, except there's just not enough space for the upgraded um, service we need to get everything up to current code. Uh, process, process right now in terms of where I'm at, I'm um, preparing to contact Coastal Commission, Army Corps of Engineers and start getting their preliminary input on it. What I'm hoping to get is permit waivers out of this and not have to go to the full permit process. Uh, as I said, there's a lot of eelgrass in there and if, if they make us dance around eelgrass, it's going to change the whole thing. So not quite sure where we'll go with that if they end up going in that direction. Um, and the final big uncertainty on this project is funding. Um, I've you know, when I get to, I'll talk a little bit about now. When we get to the budget item, we'll talk about it some more. Um, we finished out last year, 1718 in the black, not by much. It's unfortunately it's only five digits in the 50 thousands, so we're not putting hundreds of thousands of dollars away every year um, at this point into our accumulation fund. But we are balanced, and we got about 375 thousand dollars in the bank right now. So. Uh, that probably is not going to be enough to do that whole project. So I'm reviewing how I'm going to go about funding it, whether I'm going to do it in phases and do a north half, south half thing or not, um, and see what the what the electrical cost is going to be to pull all that new electrical service. Any questions on that? R relative. Oh, go ahead, Dana. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering: uh, is this design of, available to to be seen somewhere at your office or? Elsewhere? Yeah, yeah the basics of it, yeah. Go ahead. Does the resolution for the uh, reserve fund basically impact our current reserves in that we're earmarking a portion of that 375000 plus 50 at this point? Well, again, it'll depend on how we go about it and how we fund it over three years. I mean, yeah, in theory, we could take a chunk of it out of there now and put it aside. Or we could say, okay, we're, we don't touch accumulation fund now and start putting aside as we can. It just depends on how council ends up agreeing to go forward and how, you know, us and working with finance, how we come up with a plan to move it forward. It might just be semantics, but there's a, there, at present, one, the existing fund is a, quote, accumulation fund, unquote. It's sort of intended for maintenance, maintenance, if you will, or replacement, as opposed to a, a res, quote reserve unquote fund. It's a little little different animal, which doesn't diminish the importance of your question you just asked. Yeah, the general fund is is there's got an emergency reserve versus a, and a reserve, and we've always just had what's called an accumulation fund, which has been everything. It's been our pot where we go to for capital projects and big purchases and for emergencies. Um, knock on wood, we've not had a ton of big emergencies we've had to go fund, but there's been times when you know we've had storm damage where we have to go in and pull out of it. But it's never been, we've never consciously separated, the city's never consciously separated off any portion of it just purely for as an emergency reserve. Relative to the slips and their replacement and permitting, is there any um, acknowledgement on the part of the regulatory agencies? Well, first of all, is is the footprint the same, or is it different? For the most part, yes. It's the south slips had to take a little bit of a twist 
in if you look from above a little bit of a clockwise twist but yeah if we're proposing to essentially put in back in what's there now and do and do the regulatory bodies um, give any credit to their permitting to the fact that they exist now and you're not talking about covering up more bottom than it already is covered or is that just a fig newton in my imagination one would hope <laughs> sometimes i to be honest be not always sure which way the regulatory bodies will go unpredictable is that your experience it could depend on what was permitted originally in the first place if it was permitted originally in the first place okay Thanks. Status of the Coast Guard building, <coughs> excuse me, expansion project. So City Council previously approved a consent to landowner for the Coast Guard to pursue a, basically an add-on to the backside of their building. Um, as you know, they um, got about a million four, I think it's about a million six now to try and build themselves some more space. They're, they're got about one third of the size that they really need for their mission and their staffing, and they can't um, accommodate um, both males and females right now, they can only accommodate men because they just don't have the facilities for both. Um, so they want to expand out and, and try and alleviate that. So they've been working with us since probably about 2013 to identify a spot. As you know, we've run a few things by the Harbor Advisory Board, you know, them taking over our spot where our harbor office is, them going over to where the restroom is, you know, between us and Krill Saltwater Taffy. Um, the only way that any of those iterations really work, they, they preferred our site, you know, where our harbor office is, but we don't have the money to build ourselves a new office and move. And so far they've been unwilling, or not unwilling, but, but unable to find a way to fund um, anything more than their $1 a year rent um, on their current building or on the site that our office is on because we would need some sort of funding to float a loan to be able to build us a new building. So they're still looking into that. They're getting appraisals done on the property in our building and they're gonna come up with their own proposal for what they think fair market rent ought to be. If it's enough to fund us to go seek loans, it may change the project's um, look. But right now they're looking at building onto the backside of their building, um, about 1,400 square feet, I think, 1,800 square feet. Um, they're going through, getting ready to go through the city's concept approval process, concept plan approval process, um, and submit the plans to the Planning Commission to go through that review, and then it'll go to City Council review, um, and then they'll put it out to bid. And in the meantime, we'll negotiating on a lease um, modification and, and see if they can pay some fair market rent on it um, or not. So we'll see where that goes. Any questions on that? I do. Um, as far as parking, I know that area for you guys, as well as the Coast Guard, you need to have um, just kind of a circle for them to come through and then exit. Is that going to be taken away with a new building on the east side? Their parking that's right up against their building on the back side, as you pull into the parking lot, the first, I think there's five spaces there, it will be taking away those five spaces. And that's one of the things we're negotiating over is how much they're going to pay if they have to do a parking in lieu or replace that parking somewhere else. That's still under negotiation. But the drive-through will still be Won't affect the drive-through. So still, the driveway won't change. And when you pull into that driveway, if, if you're pulling in the driveway and you're seeing the Coast Guard on your left and, and more or uh, more by Oyster Company on your right, and you hook a hard left into the parking lot, you're still going to hook a hard left in that parking lot. You're just going to have a building there instead of vehicles in those first five spots. Okay, thanks. Yep. Gene. Anything else on that? Yes. Um, the city has stop their their free in lieu parking program i understand so now if you want to get a parking uh, space it's around thirty thousand dollars so if we eliminate five parking spaces that's one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to the city it was fifteen thousand i think kathy just told me it was thirty so. wow so that program is it was like a two-year yeah. waiver and or something i may like be that. wrong maybe 15 which yeah. is only seventy five thousand yeah. dollars is is that one of the city's negotiating points? Yeah. Okay. And has the Coast Guard made a, a calendar time c 
commitment relative to their appraisal? <laughs> well, yeah, it's overdue. It was supposed to be done back in, I want to say, August or September. They submit it to OMB or then it gets lost in the big federal shuffle. It's underway. We've been contacted a couple times by an appraiser. Um, so it's happening, apparently happening, but it was supposed to have been done a month or so ago. An appraiser the city knows? No. No, it was nobody I recognized. Well, Could have been be. somebody in Virginia for all I know. Well, should be very interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay, and then we go through the laundry list of various lease sites that are under redevelopment or lease renewals or combinations thereof. Um, 124, 128, Morro Bay Landing, X Verges. Um, as everyone's probably seen, that's no longer there. Uh, they demoed it over the last week or so. Um, all the land side buildings were demolished. Found a couple interesting pipes underground nobody knew about. Fortunately, there's nothing in them. Probably old Navy fuel piping from when we had a landing craft training base. Um, so they're, they're excavating and recompacting and doing whatever they, they're going to do there to get that site ready and, and start building. Um, I think one of the first things that happens is the road gets realigned. That curve that went around the old Tognazanis 3 was not to whatever semi-truck spec it needed to be. So that, that curve gets a new curve put to it and cuts through about halfway where Togs 3 used to be. So they have to put a new cur curb cut out on the road and realign all that and redo those parking spaces. So that will be getting done. And then repaving. Um, I've actually asked the contractor for a... Um, a quote to pave that whole alleyway from where they're stopping for Fowler's project all the way past the fish dock to Tognazini's dockside because, as mm -hmm. you know, that place is an absolute mess. So I'm hopefully going to be able to piggyback onto that project and save some money and see if we can get that paved in there. We'll see what happens. Um, so until then, it's all torn down and, and big construction site. So, Gene, you got anything to add on that? It's your part of your project. No. <laughs> We're just we're moving ahead, so yeah. I didn't find any skeletons, so no, that's no good. bones. No. <laughs> just a few old pipes. I mean, it's all fill, so yeah. I suspect they'd find much. Questions on that one? Okay. Uh, next door, Harbor Hut, one twenty-two, one twenty-three. Um, Troy's got permits to build and connect the his head float from Fowler's at Morbay Landing over to Gaff Cove. Um, or over to the where the old bait dock used to be, Fowler on the other side over there. And then I think he's putting a slip or two in as well as part of that. So um, he's been getting his eelgrass studies and, and moving forward and getting ready to put those docks in. So that should start fairly soon. Any questions on that? Next one to the south, 102, 102W105, it's Central Coast Fuel and Ice, basically Giovanni's and the fish market. There's two leases there. Um, both leases there on holdover. Um, the the lease on the fuel dock end is pretty much all a water lease. Um, that is from the seawall on out, fairly small lease site. And then the lease to the south um, continues on about halfway down the, the wharf and then takes a funny angle into the southeast and grabs about half of the fish market building um, and kind of a big triangle chunk. So. Um, Fairly recently engaged in negotiations with, with Giovanni Garamore and his family. Um, the interesting part on that one's going to be um, how we how we go after um, or how we pursue percent gross of revenues because we're cutting this building in half of the lease site. So um, waiting to see what um, he's proposing back in terms of moving forward on that project. And then we put in, as you know, we put in slips uh, five or six years ago now. So hopefully we start seeing some percent gross revenues from that as well. Um, as far as the square foot of this triangle, how, how many square feet of the actual building? Oh, it's... If you just take the, the fish market building part and not go over to where he's got the coffee pot and the little retail shop down below or the offices above. It's about half the fish market building. It cuts through it at a funny angle. So, you know, it comes in somewhere off the dock, goes through his back processing room, and then cuts through his market building itself somewhere and then 
up into the parking lot and then back out to the ocean. So I couldn't tell you exactly how much. It, but it's roughly about 50% of the fish market part of the building. Why wouldn't gross rent simply apply to the footprint? That's what we're going to determine. Mm -hmm. That's all being negotiated. We're trying to work that out. Mm -hmm. um, one more question for fish markets versus restaurants. What's the percentage that you'd usually get for those? Restaurants are three. Um, wholesale, retail fish, I want to say is 1% or half a percent. I don't have the schedules in front of me. It's pretty low for seafood okay. in the raw. All right. Thank you. But yeah, he's got a whole takeout thing going there too. He's got food service. Anything else on that one? Nope. Seeing none. Uh, next one, 9696W, that's House of Juju. Um, recently got precise plan approval for that. Um, working on that leaseholder with um, uh, negotiating a lease for that um, redevelopment. It started have an RFP process probably 10 years ago now. Um, he proposed to go in and, and renovate the whole site, um, scrape it to the ground eventually, but the original plan was to just do a modest remodel for five, seven years and then do the bigger project later. As he started tearing into the, the modest original remodel, he decided to, to really go in and gut the place, basically stripped it down to studs, um, remodeled, put in fire sprinklers, did a lot of good upgrades, put it back together. Um, eventual plan is to the back side that now fronts the, the harbor walk on the bay side is just storage and office space. He's converting that over to restaurant, usable, usable restaurant space. So we'll put more seats in there, which will help our revenues as well because they'll start generating more revenues. Um, the harbor walk stays relatively the same. They connect it better to the walkway that's next to the park there to do some improvements there and a little bit of park improvement. Um, and so I'm negotiating right now, trying to get a final lease in place to um, keep him moving forward. Questions on that one? Nope. Otter Rock Cafe um, site is currently in escrow for sale to the owners of the boatyard site next door. As I spoke earlier on those two amendments, um, the owner of the boatyard is proposing to take that site over, buy it, and do a pretty significant remodel of that site. Um, Otter Rock Cafe will be no more. He's got a potential new restaurateur coming in, um, doing a major remodel. It's now, it's got some kind of a, a interesting canvas roof on it now. It, was, it, it started out open air when it was first built, and then they put a partially enclosed canvas roof on it, and it's always been kind of indoor-outdoor. Um, they're putting a full solid roof on the whole thing, and, and there's a little cutout section in that building there where the gangway was going to come up from the dock that they never used. They ended up using the gangway from next door, using the dock from next door to attach. So they're going to fill that out and give themselves some more restroom space. So um, we should see not just from, um, should see some additional revenue from there too as well once they get up and operating because they're going to have more seats in there as well. Um, so that'll be a good project. And there's a fair number of um, deferred maintenance items on that site, a fair amount of structural issues with it, some restroom issues with it. Um, right now, the way it was designed originally, it had the dumpster inside the restroom, or inside the restaurant, you know, right as you walked inside, which is kind of weird. Um, so that'll be getting some major re remakes. So um, hopefully that project gets underway sometime here in the fall as well. Questions on that? Nope. Any idea what schedule? Uh, if we get the permits issued in the next three weeks, they're going to get underway on that pretty quickly. I suspect that'll be November, December, January. They want to be open for next season. And they should be able to get that completed. Um, there's some significant stuff there, but it's nothing like the seawall. And then next door at the boat yard, they're on final plan check um, for that as well on that seawall repair, harbor walk expansion that Coastal made them do. There's your answer to the regulators. You just never know what they're going to do. They made them add another two feet to the harbor walk. Um, they're replacing the docks and, and reconfiguring them a little bit putting new the little um, office kiosks that are there for the kayak and electric boat renters. Those are all getting redone. So that project, um, assuming everything keeps going, they get their permits, um, and we don't end up in court over that. Um, that's still a potential prospect. Uh, hopefully not. Um, that project should get underway sometime in de December, January is when they're planning on that. Associated Pacific's bringing all their equipment and crew up for that. 
it's a pretty major job. And then they're putting in a new, it was going to be a steel sheet wall, um, seawall, but apparently now they're going with concrete. But um, they're basically putting a new seawall outside the old seawall, and they'll just encapsulate it, tie it back to some dead men down underneath the, the existing buildings. It's a, it's a big project. So any questions on that one? Eighty-seven, eighty-eight, off the hook. Um, spoke a little bit about that earlier. Currently in interim uh, negotiations with the interim leaseholder there for a new lease on their proposed project. Um, slated for council consideration on December 11th. Um, unless we can move it faster. This, there's another council meeting on November 27th. Um, but one of those two meetings, hopefully we'll get that. Um, lease done and in, in, uh, in the bag. Next big milestone on that is the leaseholders' um, procurement of funding once we get a lease in place. Questions on that one? Nope. Libertine Pub, next door to that, 8686W. Um, that lease is in holdover. That leaseholder is intending to um, combine that site with a proposal they're doing on the market plaza project up the hill at the Stasio's restaurant in the, in the parking lot down below. The um, leaseholders teaming up with another developer to try and um, put a proposal into that project. That's being handled by community development and Stafford McCarty is the real estate um, firm that's handling that one. So kind of waiting to see if, if they propose up there and I think basically they'll probably go with some sort of rooms, um, hotel rooms down below and, and tie the two projects together, not physically per se, but as, as a redevelopment project. So we'll see where that one goes. Until then, they just keep operating as they are. Questions? What do, you, what do you mean when you say, quote, redevelopment bid, end quote? What does that mean? Currently, the city has, with Stafford and McCarty, the Distacios property and the parking lot down below on the waterfront. It used to be the old RV park, and then the public parking lot behind that across the street, that all is being collectively known as the Market Plaza project. The city is is working with Stafford and McCarty to either sell that property to somebody that wants to develop it or lease it to somebody that wants to develop it. So when I say out to bid, that it's not really out to bid, it's just out to market. No. The city's looking for somebody to come and develop it, either as a lease whole interest or buy it and do it interest. Eighty-two, eighty-five, Roses Landing. Um, recently executed a new lease there for a redevelopment project plan that Doug Redican has for that site, converting the upstairs restaurant, which has always been a tough one upstairs. Um, Windows on the Water seems to be the only restaurant here that's done well in the long term here. Um, so he's decided to convert the upstairs restaurant into 10 hotel rooms, 10 nice boutique hotel rooms. So he's got council approval for that, negotiate a new lease for him. It's executed, and hopefully he'll get underway on that project before too much longer. Any questions? Mm, nope. 6970, Morro Bay Aquarium, that lease has expired. The site is vacant. Um, current plan, as we heard a couple of meetings ago, is for Central Coast Aquarium to come in and redevelop the site, pending funding from USDA. Uh, I met with the executive director of CCA and the USDA staffer that is handling the loan application in that project last week at the aquarium site. Um, USDA is still fully on board. Um, there's a number of things that need to happen first, first being the financial feasibility study, which is underway. Um, that is close to being done. From what I understand, um, and once they get that done, they'll figure if it pencils positively, they'll figure out their next steps to move forward, um, which is what we hope to be them moving in on a um, smaller scale basis into the downstairs retail section only of the old aquarium with a touch tank and um, nice retail shop until they can get the bigger project um, further along. Any questions? Mark? Mark? Can you describe what would happen if there was a default on that multi-million dollar loan that was developed for the, on the property on the leasehold site? For USDA? Correct. The loan is not made yet? If there were to be a default, 
on a loan that's guaranteed by the F the So if USDA. the leaseholder defaulted on the USDA loan. Correct. What would what would be the impact and we've got a property, we've got a loan and we've got a leasehold interest. Typically what will occur in a what I'm gonna call it a normal circumstance with a a normal operator, a regular operator, you know, that's retail, restaurant, hotel, and a, a standard business operator is the loan, the lender acquires the property, defaults on the property, and will become the leaseholder. It's happened a couple times, and in both those instances, the um, typically what occurs, not every time, but typically what occurs is the leaseholder will, or the lender will market it and sell it because the lenders aren't in the business of running leases. Um, that is the standard sort of scenario. Um, usually if there's subtenants in there, the subtenants will keep operating under the, the lender, um, and the lender will come to the city and they'll try and figure out what they're going to do with it. If this scenario were to play out and, and USDA loaned on and they defaulted on a USDA loan, I don't know what the terms of the USDA loan are. I would suspect USDA would become the leaseholder like any other, but it depends on how this whole lease is structured and how it all goes down. I don't know what the what a USDA lease looks like. I'm sure it's somewhat different because it's to a nonprofit for a very different reason than a standard business, but best I can do. As a follow-on question, if you know, does the city intend to uh, make its interests a part of the loan agreement between the prospective loan agreement between USDA and CCA. Is the city going to co-sign? No, no. But you just quite correctly identified that the city has an interest. And we are speculating that it should a default occur that maybe USDA would become the less the, the, uh, the, lessor. the lessor. Right. Um, it just seems to me that it would be advantageous for the city to make sure that any agreement between USDA and CCA clearly spells out who, I know you, we don't own it, it's Titans Trust, but I'll use the word anyway, who owns the dirt. The city has an interest yeah. in this. Yeah, no, I know. I understand what you're saying. I, Any and every lender that lends on projects on our waterfront is well aware or, and is made aware that they're not going to own the dirt. That's why lending is often challenging because some lenders have a problem with that. They want to own the dirt yeah. if they default. So, yeah, I... Uh, that wasn't my concern, but uh, oh, but thank you. So... Uh, you you mentioned that uh, there is a desire on the part of CCA and uh, and perhaps although you didn't say this and I don't want to put words in your mouth uh, that they would operate on an interim basis in a gift shop and some sort of touch tank kind of deal. Has there been discussion about whether the rent would be at quote fair market unquote or not at fair market? I haven't worked through that yet. Okay. We're waiting to see where the financial feasibility study falls. What's that, what's that got to do with an interim arrangement? Because of the financial feasibility points in the red, they're likely not going to go to USDA for funding because USDA is not going to fund them if the financial feasibility doesn't pencil. Yeah. Therefore, there will be no project. And they would, and they would therefore abandon their interest in operating a gift shop, an interim gift shop and touch tank on that site. We're waiting to see how the financial feasibility pencils out mm -hmm. to see how they're going to move forward. <clears throat> Presuming um, that financial feasibility is proven out in some way, shape, or form, by what date does CCA state that its application package will be sent to the USDA? I don't know that information. Okay, thank you. Because financial feasibility is but one of the documents that USDA needs for their application and their whole process. And that's my point. <clears throat> There's a whole other slew of documentation that's going to have a cost to it. And 
that's the next steps. Sure. The last time their executive director was here, she suggested it might actually the last two times that she discussed this that it might be a two year process. To get to the loan application process? Um, to get through all that initial application. To get through all of that yeah. and get an application in front of USDA. Yeah. It, it's really hinging on how the financial feasibility pencils mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yep. 6566, the salt building. Um, those of you who have been around a while, where Hofbrau used to be years ago. Um, current listees, fairly new lease holder there, bought it, what, two or three years ago now? They've applied for a project to convert the two upstairs office areas into two boutique hotel units. So that's pending review by the Planning Commission. That was a Jim Mall designed building and built building back in probably the 70s. Uh, it was Jim's office upstairs and, and some other offices. And so um, it's been very difficult for any leaseholder since then to put anything up there that complies with the zoning because it's all got to be visitor serving and marine dependent. So you can't just put a real estate office or anything up there. So. They're going to convert that to hotel rooms. Questions? Any idea how they're going to uh, provide parking? Not yet. <clears throat> I don't know what they're, you know, they'll, they'll do the calculations and they've got X amount of parking already attributed to the site. I don't know what the new calculations come out to be. They'll have to deal with it one way or another. If they don't have enough parking, they'll have to pay parking. Obviously, they're not going to put any on site. Maybe one to team up with, with Roses and all the others that are putting in hotel rooms and do an overall valet system. That's hopefully there's enough critical mass to do a valet system with everybody involved in participating. It makes it financially worthwhile. Anything else? Next door to that, Gray's Inn and Gallery, 6364. Um, they've got redevelopment plans already approved. Um, working on final building plans for that. I've um, been to nobody sh did some initial negotiations on a new lease for them for that redevelopment. We've put it on hold for a little bit as those leaseholders put in a proposal for the Kayak Horizons lease site next door, a redevelopment proposal for there. So we're hopefully in the next week or two, we're gonna be um, putting together a RFP evaluation team to look at those two proposals we received and, and see, who see who we're gonna recommend to the council to move forward with. Um, if it's the Grays folks, then it would make the most sense to combine either, if not those two lease sites, at least negotiations together and, and do one cohesive project from a lease standpoint. So that's where that one stands. Any questions on that? I have nope. a whole lot of questions. But they kind of go into uh, C4 with the lease management, and they have to do with all of these lease sites that you're talking about. So I think I'll wait till then, or I can go into it now. Mm, uh, if it's appropriate under C4, let's do that and keep rolling here. Okay. Yeah. If that's okay with you. It's okay. Go as fast as I can. <laughs> um, Kayak Horizons put out to RFP, got two proposals. Um, again, one from the folks that run the Grays Inn and one from um, the folks that run the stand-up paddleboard company down a few more doors down. So we'll be looking at those here shortly. 3536, it's the empty water only lease site down at the south end. Um, working on an RFP for that site development. Um, used to be where our old league's um, fish market there was down there. And uh, a lot of fish activity used to happen down there, but long gone. I'm um, also going to be combining that RFP with the lease site next door, 34W. We call it the Chrysler Marina. Um, Bob Chrysler is the owner of that marina. It's a little four slip complex, tiny little complex with some strange access through the private property to a parking space across the street to where they park it. Um, so we're looking at putting those two together and, and put those both out to public bid and see if there's any interest in developing. We know there is interest from the adjacent landowner, so we'll see where that goes. Any questions on that? Uh, just that 35W through 36, you can only get to that by water, so I can understand the combination, combining it with 34W. Is that the idea here? Uh, it's not necessarily combine the sites together as one. It's combine an RFP for development. It could be a together or a separate development. With joint ac or could, access could to propose. go through to the other one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And leaseholders from either end can access as well. So there's a few possibilities there. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to try and quickly go through. I have the a suggestion for these, if it's okay with you, Eric, and it's okay with the board. Given that this is sort of in sort of internal business here, the status of the pending. Um, if it's okay with you, unless there's been some change that you want to talk about, maybe we could just take them by number and see if the board has any questions or comments. No, that's fine. Okay. Anything? Any changes of note that you'd for any of the numbered items that you'd like to address? Uh, item three, boatyard RFP is out on the street. We got that out on Monday or Tuesday. I think it might have been Tuesday morning. <clears throat> got it on the city's website, sent it to a whole slew of different people and entities, posting it online. Um, so that's a change. Uh, item four, the cost allocation plan, um, master fee schedule stuff. We've been working with the city's consultant on that, so work in progress. Um, nothing more for the have to really think or do on that. Otherwise, nothing more on the numbered ones unless anybody else has a question. Okay, on so we'll take it to the board and start uh, with Gene. Do you have anything, that any comments or questions on one through eight? eight. Jeremiah? No. Lynn? No. Mark? No. Dana? No, I'll get it for C4. Okay, Charisse? Uh, just for um, one, um, it looks like it was over five months ago. Is there any um, planned times that you want to look into that again? Is there any correspondence in the future planned? I don't have anything on my calendar. Trying to get parks reengaged. Okay. Item number two. When is it on the council's agenda? Item number two is on the council's agenda. It is not on the council's agenda yet. Okay. Um. Is. Uh, and forgive me for asking the question because I, I'm, I'm confident the answer is yes, but is the city manager aware that Harbor Advisory Board and the mayor aware of the Harbor Advisory Board would like to see that on the agenda? That amongst several other things, yes. Yes, okay, good. And uh, item four. Has a consultant, has a, con a contract been let? I guess you sort of implied yes. it, that it has yeah. because, you're, because, you're, because you're working with a consultant. Yeah, the, the city hired a consultant to work on the cost allocation plan and the city's basically everything on the master fee schedule for cost recovery, uh, the, the fee analysis. That's the first part that's happening. Um, and then they'll go into cost allocation plan, and then they'll go into impact fees. So, yeah, the city has a consultant, and they are actively working. We've met with them a couple times already on fee stuff. Okay. And for the record, I'll just report that relative to item number five, that the board and the city manager have been in communication regarding this, this item, and uh, the city manager is aware of the board's uh, feelings about the importance of addressing it and uh, s the city manager tells us that there will be some steps taken to address it uh, within the next several months. He didn't say several months, he said 2019. I don't want to misrepresent what he said. Uh, that's also the case for item 8 as well. Okay. Anything else? Staff report? Board? Eric, you I'm content? Done. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> I'm all talked out. <laughs> okay. All right. C1. C1. <clears throat> Update from the Marine Service of Facility Boatyard Ad Hoc Committee on Committee's recent activities. We still have no um, uh, live public with us this evening, so we don't worry about that. Dana? Uh, thank you. Uh, first, I'll start off with the uh, the boat storage just kind of go on a little bit more about that it's uh talking to staff 
It's opening December 1st, $100 a month. Um, right now there's three trailers there. There's uh, approximately 15 names on the waiting list. They're gonna basically move the pilings around to designate parking areas. And then you get a, a placard with a number on it that goes on your trailer to identify who, who you are. And so they can keep track of who's renting, who's there, who's, who owns, whatever. Um, they're gonna hold off on the fencing uh, right now, which you can kind of understand. Um, so anyways, for that, uh, interested boaters can contact the Harbor Department Get their names on the list. Uh, I think uh, not planning on doing any advertising at this time. Uh, just going to be word of mouth, and you're going to look over there and see boats and trailers, and hopefully the word gets out. So, uh, moving on to the uh, marine facility, the feasibility study. The uh, the RFP has gone out on that. It was Wednesday, October 30th. Uh, it closes February 1st is the response deadline and uh, we've got a pretty good list here after talking to staff about uh, different entities that had been contacted outside the posting on the city website which is uh, pretty easy to find under bid postings for anybody who wants to look it up um, looks like that <laughs> And um, I guess I can just briefly kind of go over this. RFP is, um, for the fe feasibility study, it's uh, a phased, uh, it's proposed to be phased in the fact, in the way that um, as you're going along with the study, the first phase looking at um, regulatory and familiarizing yourself with the city and, and uh, the project uh, criteria, if that doesn't look like it's gonna pan out, then they don't proceed. The same thing happens with the second phase. Um, uh, with the pro project concepts and going right through the private sector design, public-private partnership, or the public sector design. Um, so if that doesn't look like it's panning out to be uh, uh, doable, then they'll stop before going into phase three. So um, this is kind of how it was laid out, and I want to thank staff for doing a great job, and also uh, Chair Reisner for doing a, a big effort in helping put this together. Um, That's all I have right now. Okay, questions? Sharice? Uh, not at this time. Mark? Lynn? Yes, I... Um, have you said that there are three boats in there in the open storage area now, paying $100 a month? Well, there's three trailers. There's three one, trailers. One's on, there's a boat on one. Okay. How, uh, there's space for how many? Well, we originally said 50, but I, I think it all depends on how many we get in there. And uh, the price does not vary by the size of the vehicle? I think there's a space is 10 by, 12, 10 by 30. It depends on... Uh, yeah, it's 100, 100 whether you're not a size, doesn't matter. Yeah. That's what city council approved. That's what we... Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, go ahead. No, that's all. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about it. If there is 50, is that's good. That's a fair number. But will that diminish the size of the other project, the Boyard project? In the original project, there were 50 sites of uh, storage in that also. So it, in, a, in a new project, it probably just moved to a different area. Um, but I think the whole project would change so much that it would be designed to where they're much tighter. And I think right now it's a little bit. So uh, the answer is yes, it would change the. Uh, so it would in fr the 50 uh, trailers as planned now 
would infringe on areas that were designated for possible boatyard. That well, yes and no, but the original design shows storage area outside of the boat, boat yard itself. Part of the marine facility design has boat storage in it. It's a, it's so one did part you of go the project. By the original design, is that how it, it's? No, right now it's just using the lot and, and but it's not getting paved or any Im huge improvements. So it's just a matter okay, of I, moving them around. Yeah, yeah if, if the, the boat yard, boat yard, boat service yard comes to be, the, the trailer stuff's gonna move it's, it takes second oh, fiddle. Re reconfiguration. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the only question. I and just to add on, you done, Dan, you got more? No, go I don't want to jump on you, but um, we made an executive decision not to put in fencing for now. We're going to outline it with those pilings we've gotten out there. One, just to see what our usage is. Two, because we, we you know, Dana helped me greatly, and thank you for doing some potential layout out there. And then we took our own boat on our big boat on our trailer out there and, and put some cones and started playing with the boat and mixing things around to see what would work. And we're just not exactly sure what kind of configuration is going to work. So I don't want to hem myself into a fence at this point. Um, so we're just going to outline it with pilings and put some fencing up and um, or put some um, signs up and, and get those what you see on construction sites that I call them the nails with the big nylon bright orange hair sticking out. You know, put those to designate the sites so we can move things around and play with it a little bit and see what kind of a configuration works. And then if we do figure out what works well and we have enough interest and, and um, we start approaching, you know, 35, 40, 50 boats, then start thinking about putting up the fencing because then we'll have a better idea what might work best. So that's Gene. the plan with that. Yes, you, um, did you put out a bid, a request for bids for the fencing and how much? Yeah, we put out, we got quotes from three different companies. They range from, it's got to be a um, prevailing wage, and the, the bids range from about sixteen to $19,000. Jeremiah? So, so Eric, can, uh, can we put that out, say, to the M MBCFO's membership? That yeah. These are? Yeah. Dana said we're, we're not advertising, we're not right this second. As soon as we get it, sort of what we're calling open for business and we're ready for it, then I'm going to start advertising. I don't want a bunch of people showing up too early to where we're not ready for them. So. But yeah, you can tell the membership, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I would say tell everybody before it you know, gets filled up with a bunch of boats from the valley. That'd be a great thing to do is, rather than dragging your boat across all the time, is to be able to park it, come over here, and just put it in the water. And commercial fishermen well, we, get a preference to we have a, priority. We have a lot of trailer boats, and as one can imagine, uh, that participate in the commercial fishing industry, one can imagine uh, storing these boats is a problem for many, because you end up leaving them on the street or somewhere, and it's, they'd, I'm sure be very interested in an opportunity like that. Yeah, I'll reiterate. I, I know I've said this before, but it's that storage yard is one of the only places, Morro Bay, that you can go from there to the launch ramp without any overhead lines. So if you've got, you know, trolling poles up and things like that or mast, then you're good to go. Okay, anything else? Therese. Just a little bit more information. Is it boats only? Okay. Yes, we and initially proposed boats and RVs if we didn't fill it up with boats and council said no RVs, we want boats only. Okay, and then as far as time frames that people can be on them? Well, just, just a uh, boats or boat trailers. Oh, no, I, I, he answered my question. I was oh, referring oh, 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 to okay. bumper poles or houses on wheels. <laughs> Tiny um, houses, no. The other one is um, um, the hours that they're able to be in there when they are either working on their boats or their boat trailers? Is there designated times where they're not allowed to be in there? Whether it was fenced or not, we weren't going to stipulate any hours on it. Um, you know, some people go in early in the morning, late at night. Uh, as far as working on things, you're supposed to do a, it, work on your, on your, really should be work on your trailers limited to if something has occurred, you get a flat or a 
something goes wrong with the trailer, you need to fix it because you can't move it. It's not meant to be a working yard. You're not supposed to be tearing things apart and pulling your engines out and dumping it, oil on the ground. It too. might have happened before you joined us, but there was a, um, a, a round of discussion and now a published policy about, about the use, or a rental, a rental policy is a better way to put it. That's a now published rental policy and has quite a few provisions about that stuff in it. Fuel storage, working on things, making a mess, not making a mess. Not making a mess. Did did we put that one in? No power. Did we put not living on it? I don't think we did. Where were you when we needed you? Holy smokes, folks. Okay, anything else on this one? Okay, good, thanks. Okay, that brings us to C2. Again, and I apologize to the folks that are home because I suggested you weren't live. Um, you are a live, but you're not live here. <laughs> it, it is Halloween, and I don't want to get too far. Oh, it was last night. <laughs> See, I'm really messed up. So C2, uh, we, we still have no folks with us here this evening uh, other than Councilman Makowetsky, and uh, I don't see him leaping up to the podium. So C2 is an update from the Finance Budget Ad Hoc Committee and the, on the committee's recent activities and uh, a second part, which is discussion of, discussion of possible revenue sources and or expenditure cuts to fund the recently established Harbor Accumulation Fund Reserve. And if I had any kind of memory, I would remember the resolution number, 80-something dash something. Dash 18, what a, what a guy. Tell you that much. 85-18. <laughs> okay, uh, Mark? Yeah, uh, we had the we've had the opportunity to meet and uh, do some brainstorming and some uh, <clears throat> getting into some background numbers uh, to start off with. Currently, we're looking at uh, capital needs in excess of about 2.2 million that we expect they'd be seeing over the next five to six years. And uh, Four hundred seventeen thousand dollars of earmarked reserves for this this particular fund. In total, that comes out to approximately two million six hundred seventeen thousand, and over a five-year horizon, we currently have reserves of about three hundred fifty or three hundred seventy-five, as we were speaking to earlier. And at a let's say a aggressive positive flow rate going forward of eighty-three thousand uh, dollars per year which would over a five year period grant us 400,000. We would see something in the, at the uh, end of five years of $750,000 of usable funds against the 2 million six that we currently are looking at both earmarking and need for capital improvements. That leaves us with about a million eight hundred fifty thousand dollar shortfall between revenue and expected operations. Um, you divide that over a five-year period, that's $370,000 a year revenue shortfall to fund our operations and our capital improvements cash over cash. Not, not looking at anything being borrowed, not looking at anything with regard to grants or other forms of, of uh, income that may be, or uh, avoidance of expense that may be needed. So that's sort of the background of the, the dollar figures that we're looking at with regard to uh, having to raise additional forms of revenue in a nutshell. So we are looking for all forms of contribution or programs that would contribute to this because obviously it's not going to be uh, one particular item that's going to probably do the trick for us, whether it be improved uh, leasehold conditions where the income from the individual leaseholders is providing additional revenue streams in this level. And uh, so we've been looking at some different forms of, of uh, possible funding. And we're looking at In a general sense, we need to look both at our leasehold interests, as we've said that our audits are not currently up to date, where that may or may not provide some level of funding, is not looking to be able to provide 
a substantial indent on this particular portion of it. Uh, we've talked possibly of doing some independent gap analysis of where there may be uh, market conditions or opportunity to look at leases that are coming up that would uh, provide us with uh, additional potential income. In other words, highest and best use type of opportunities. We also probably need to address our rental interests, uh, which are dock rentals, of course, and other rental interests that we have that we are not normally focused on as far as Embarcadero waterfront. There may be other potential opportunities. And then, of course, fees and services, which I don't think that we could ever expect to see $350,000 a year in additional fees and services because that would be coming from those that are most utilizing the services that we're providing. So another area that we need to look at and probably do some analysis is either unutilized or underutilized assets, uh, other land and space that are part of the trust but either are not being, being used or not being used to a highest and best use that may be able to provide additional income. Grants also would be an area that we need to possibly pursue. What we can use the grants for probably are more in terms of capital improvement than we could obtain grants for capital maintenance of existing. So that's sort of limits where and how we can obtain them. And uh, beyond that, we're looking for us as a board to provide the input uh, with working with staff as to where we can come up with a significant chunk of cash over a significant period of time to help provide for the needs of our waterfront. As well as the council's recent resolution regarding a reserve and to round out the committee's report, um, over the last, the Harbor Advisory Board has been working on potential funding sources as directed by council on our goals and objectives uh, for two years now, about two years. And the, some of the things that, uh, in addition to the things that Mark mentioned as potential revenue sources, we've also identified in no particular order uh, a share of T-bid a uh, share of TOT, a share of the sales tax derived from the businesses located on the Titleist Trust, and a share of possessory interest revenue derived from businesses located on Titleist Trust lands. Um, that's been part of the dialogue with the city manager. Um, the city manager, uh, in his recent communication, said that a discussion about uh, a portion of TBID uh, could perhaps move forward. Uh, the city is not enthusiastic about um, uh, considering a share of, apparently at this time, considering a share of TOT sales tax or possess possessory interest tax. Uh, that's an ongoing dialogue. Also, the um, uh, we brought up uh, paid parking on and around the Embarcadero. Uh, we did that some time ago. Uh, we haven't heard anything back yet from council, but the city manager says that that's something that is part of the current funding dialogue that's going on up in the hill and will go on into uh, 2019. And um, uh, he also said that the city is in the process or is has developed or is developing a fiscal resiliency plan that's capital F capital R capital R P a fiscal resiliency plan uh, which is considering long-term revenue options and that uh, apparently includes potentially a parcel assessment specific to the harbor lands and uh, let's see, we also identified, the Harbor Advisory Board identified a series of, of I would say, l lesser items in terms of their potential. And I don't think we need to take the time now to talk about those, but that rounds out the committee's report. Questions from the board? Okay. Thank you, Mark. Lynn? Yeah, the there were 80 non-emergent 
see toes for this past month. As I understand it, you're charging about three hundred dollars after the first one. After the first one, um, has there been much revenue from that new policy? I do not know what our tow numbers are at this moment and what we've charged for. No, I do not know. This is uh, I know about one tow and she paid $300 for it. Um, so I would be curious because out of 80, even if those were half of those were a first time only and therefore free, that still amounts to a significant amount of money for one month, about $12,000. Are you referring to the department activity statistic? Yes, I am. That's 80 calls for service. 80 calls for service. That wasn't toes. Okay. Calls for service are everything from, it's a catch-all. How many of those might be toes? I don't know. When you said 80 toes, I went, wow, we've been yeah. doing a lot of towing. That struck me. <laughs> now, those, those could be a tow. Those could be somebody calling and saying there's a sea lion injured. There could be calling for dumping oil. Dumping oil. It could be a dispute over something down the docks. It could be a report of somebody sleeping in the dunes. They need to come look at it. It's anything. It's anything and everything. Okay, so they're not all those. Beyond our normal scope of duties of driving and boating around and finding things and doing things. This is things that people have called us for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there may be some toes in there, but I couldn't tell you how many. Well, the 80 sounded awfully high. Well, just to wrap it up, <laughs> uh, what happens to the to funds that are uh, received uh, from toes? They, they just go into our normal revenue streams. There are probably other miscellaneous, miscellaneous income or other harbor services is probably where they go. One of our catch-all budget items that gets our shower money and our hoist revenue and all sorts of other small, odd things. If you've had a chance to think about it yet, as the department has had a chance to think about it, is any of that stuff a candidate for for the re to uh, f for the reserve to build the re help build the reserve fund? To earmark something a yeah. line item, hey, yeah, that's a way of looking at it. I mean, there's, there's more than one ways to, to skin that cat in terms of how to set aside. I spoke earlier. You know, do we want to? Are we, we going to take some out of the accumulation fund now and, and start a kitty? Or are we just going to start forward from now and put X amount of dollars? You could look at it from a line item standpoint. We want to put everything from North T Pier dockage rental into that item or something. I mean, you could do anything like that. If you Which is a b budget balancing act. It's a budget balancing act, yeah. Because that becomes unavailable for the operating budget. I spoke earlier that it, it looks like last year we ended, once you get rid of all the other accounting mumbo jumbo and, and things that are just on paper and not real dollars that, that came and went, um, we ended the year about fifty, fifty-one, fifty-two thousand dollars in the black. So that's a pretty thin margin. Um, but it's a margin, and hopefully improving with lease negotiations and leases that weren't on percent gross revenues coming on to percent gross revenues. Some of these redevelopments will take a little more time for the leases. The leases are our biggest item. They generate you know a million six per year out of the two point one, two point two. So. But the downside of those is they're also long term, and we can't just go in and change a fee schedule to make them do anything different. They're in long term leases. So, okay. Anything else on this item? C two. No. Okay. Thanks. C three. Uh, and we um, still do not have uh, any folks with us in person this evening, so we don't have any public comment. C3 is update from the Eelgrass Ad Hoc Committee. Lynn? Yes. Uh, the Thank you. I've had it on all night. The National Estuary Program has come out with their 
2017 eelgrass report. And uh, they did surveys this year and have compared them to previous surveys. The amount of eelgrass is apparently is fairly stable. It came out to be 13.4 acres for 2017. In 2013, it was 15 acres, so it was down a bit. But last year, it was up. In 16, it was up a little bit. I just don't happen to remember that number. Uh, of the ongoing studies that are being done to identify the reason for the decline, there are a few conclusions. No, most of those studies are ongoing, and there is nothing that really can be pinpointed as a particular reason. So what the NEP, the National Estuary Program, is doing, they are still compiling information. They are getting the results of the various uh, studies done by Cal Poly. Uh, to gather information and see what can be done better for mitigation. Uh, they're comparing things like uh, transplanting using seeds, using seed bags, uh, doing it with divers, and transplanting with rhizomes. Um, and again, not enough information is there to really know what will be best. We do know that eelgrass is growing in the front end of the bay, but it is not really recovering in the back end of the bay, which is the biggest problem because that's where we've got area. Uh, and it's growing along the Embarcadero in front of all the businesses where there's lots of activity and where we don't really want it. <laughs> but so it goes. The conceptual report that, was, that we got from QEA and the plan uh, we hoped would go to city council to get city council approval and get some um, agreement from city council that this is important and perhaps even have them make some kind of a contribution toward uh, fleshing out this plan, having QEA do a little more work on it. Uh, unfortunately, that we hoped would go by the end of this year, i.e. by the December meetings, but they, those have been pushed off until January, and we hope they won't be displaced even further by other more Im important measures. So we're kind of on a holding pattern until we see what happens with City Council and what their action is. If anybody wants to uh, see the report, it is available online, the National Estuary Program uh, Morro Bay Eelgrass Report. Uh, did, you, did you just give the online, the internet location? I, I was a little confused. Yes. Say it one more time, please. Uh, National Estuary Program, it's, oh dear. I don't, I don't have the exact web address. If they went on to the Morro Bay NEP site? Morro Bay it? NEP site slash eel, uh, Morro Bay Eelgrass Report. It's www.mbnep.org, and then I'm sure you can find it. It's a good yeah. website. It's easy to navigate. Okay. Lynn, anything else in your report? Um, Eric, do you want to add anything to that? No, other than get to council to approve moving to the next step. The next step would be um, going to the regulators and seeing if they'll accept that approach um, that we're proposing to pursue in terms of a, an alternative to the standard eelgrass mitigation. Um, because obviously if they're not receptive, there's no point in pursuing it. So. It's looking like that's going to be the January, what did I tell you today? January, January 8th. 8th? 8th? January City Council 8th. meeting? Yeah. yeah, January 8th. Okay. Therese? Dana? No. Mark? No? Jeremiah? No. Gene? Yeah, I, I would be curious what Neil has to say about the eelgrass and 
several months ago, he said eel grass was starting to flourish up here, and I would hope that that would show up in the latest um, studies. I also spoke to a man who was doing eel grass restoration down in San Diego for a dredge company that was doing some work down there, and the dredge company was losing oh, $50,000 a day, um, and so they just told the, the guys who were transplanting, just pick it up in buckets and take it over there and throw it over there, and we'll call it good. So that's very interesting. We'll see how it came out. You mean, you mean whether it took yeah. after yeah, being yeah. thrown? From what I understand, it probably will not. But for the first 30 days, it looked pretty good. Wow. Well, they're just going to have to do it again. So, Lynn, uh, Lynn the, um, uh, the last time we talked about this, the NEP was going to have a board meeting, and they were going to determine whether the NEP was in a position to do some sort of cooperative arrangement with the city relative to moving this policy thing forward. What did they decide? The board of the NEP is not eager or does not want to become a regulatory agency or an, an official um, the official mitigator, if you will. They don't want to be in a position to be hired by project proponents to do the mitigation. Recognizing that, um, we did not make another alteration in the conceptual plan. That is, the conceptual plan is still as it was, as we got it um, last August. Uh, what we are hoping to do now is get something from um, the City Council, get some encouragement from the City Council, and then go back to the NEP and see what kind of negotiations, to what extent, other than being a font of information which they are very happy to do, uh, to see how how we they could make how we could make it work. So it's up in the air. Um, Is there any anticipation that uh, prior to the city council making some determination uh, to expressing the formal interest of the city sitting down with the NEP and talking about? Um, <clears throat> some sort of mutually beneficial arrangement? No, that has not been discussed. I recommend it. Okay, anything okay. else? <clears throat> this one? No? Okay, that uh, takes us to C4. We still do not have uh, public with us right here in this building this evening. C4 is an update on the Harbor Department lease management policy update process. Harbor Advisory Board consideration and input on proposed policy update timeline and financial audits and lease site inspection sections of the policy and update from Harbor Advisory Board policy update working group members. Wow, there is a tongue twister. Staff report. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, there's a few elements to this. Um, so I want to put in front of the Harbor Advisory Board tonight a, a few different items. Um, we've got our two policy mem two policy update members on the Harbor Advisory Board, um, Therese Hansen and um, Mark Blackford, um, sitting on that group. The group I'm still putting together. It's um, Still got to get some council direction at the next meeting on November 13th, I want to say. Might be the 11th. November 13th. Um, council asked me to come back. They, they, they approved the, the overall plan that we proposed, which we brought through the Harvard Advisor Board a few months, a few months, a few meetings ago. Um, the overall plan and, and how to go about the process, what they wanted a little bit uh, more detail on was a new timeline. They thought the existing timeline was too short, which it was very short. Um, 
we were trying to get something done by the end of the year, but they said, no, take the time to do it right and spend more time. And so they said, bring back a, a longer timeline. And they also said, look into potentially finding um, a moderator or facilitator to help with the process. Um, I basically call it herding the cats, um, helping with our working group and staff and keeping the process moving forward and, and keeping track of work product and um, not getting directly involved in the work product. In other words, not attending meetings to weigh in on whether we should do A, B, or C, but um, helping the, the different groups and subgroups manage their time and their work product. Um, so that's going to council on November 11th. The proposed timeline I've got in front of you tonight, I want to just get the have to make a quick look at that. And then we, I queued up two things in the lease policy that we're going to have um, add on documentation to the policy. In other words, the policy itself will be sort of a 30,000 overview look. And then inside the policy will be multiple documents that spell out in more detail how we go about some things, two of those things being lease site audits and lease site inspections for maintenance and, and um, overall lease site operation. Um, I thought we'd get those queued up to get a bit of a head start on those because those are two things the council has been pretty interested in um, as part of the lease policy update. Um, so I'll queue those up and then if the um, working group, Sharice and, and Mark want to add anything, they can add anything. So I'll, um, I guess I'll work through this and then we'll see how we want to take it in terms of the working group. So the timeline I'm, I've proposed now is um, for the, in the month of November, the staff and the working group, and if we retain a moderator, um, which I'm currently getting a couple of proposals from um, some folks that do that as, as paid moderators that do that for a living, and also from a couple of folks that have offered up their services as well. So um, depending on how, what direction we go with that, in November we'll just basically determine everybody's roles, responsibilities, and how we're going to execute the process and lay out um, timeline and, and sort of meeting schedules and meeting structure. November and December, I propose, um, in addition to the, the putting together a working group and, and figuring out how we're going to operate, um, I'm calling the research and fact-finding phase. Um, as I've stated before, we've looked at the policies of a couple other agencies, Port of LA and Port of San Diego being two of them that um, are multi, probably almost billion dollar agencies that generate a lot more revenue and they generate a lot broader and more detailed documentation. So I'm, uh, I'm not shy about stealing other people's documents. So we should be looking at other folks and seeing how they manage their um, leases. And so we'll be doing research and, and find out what other information is out there and who else we might want to talk to um, on the outside of this group, like bankers and real estate folks and, and whatnot. And in January, um, create an outline of the policy structure and determine exactly you know, what sort of documents we want to pr produce. Do we want, you know, an audit sub-policy or do we want a maintenance sub-policy? Just kind of determining um, what our overall um, policy is going to look like in the end. And then February through April is do the work. Um, it could start earlier. You know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things happening concurrently, but that's when we'll actually do the update, um, put the working group together and I'm sure those groups are going to break into subgroups and uh, we'll be reaching out to staff and others uh, to do the work to create the documentation. And then May 14th is a city council meeting night. Um, bring a draft updated policy and, and our work to date to the council for a, a reality check and, and um, direction from the council. And then as needed, bring work products and questions and decision points to the Harbor Advisory Board um, on any particular evening. Maybe it ends up being we have a, a standing agenda item like we do some of these others and uh, we can come back when there's input needed from the HAB or from the community. Um, and we can use the HAB forum to take input there as well. So any questions or comments or input on the timeline? Does anybody have any suggestions, hopes, dreams, desires about that? Gene. No. No. Jeremiah, Lynn, mm -mm. Mark, Dana, no. Therese. Uh, I have a suggestion, and that is that um, you insert an item between B and C, a dated item, January 7, working group, evaluate results of research and fact-finding, 
in preparation for development of a general outline policy structure. And then, and then, well, this is them, not us. And then on, and, and then on C, uh, insert uh, the January 14 into that. Give it a time certain, date certain. What, please, is the significance of January 14th? Is there something about that date I'm not? Yeah, you've got January 22. You're marching along here. So I'm just, okay. I was trying to get, trying to provide, I was trying to suggest dates that I gave as much time as possible without altering January 22 because it's a pretty tight schedule. Okay. But that's entirely mutable. I just, that's a, just a suggestion. Okay. But I do think that the line item is something to be considered, the additional line item. Okay, I'm going to get with you after the meeting to get your specific language because I'm sure you've got it printed out. Anything else on that? Apparently not. Okay, the other two items that I just want to run, not expecting deep discussion on necessarily. Um, probably what would be most helpful, I would think, for the two members of our working group would give them some input and some idea of, of where the HAB may stand on these two issues and that will give them some ammunition to be able to work with once they get into the working group. Um, lease site audits, the cities, we've got about 30 lease sites, uh, about 90 businesses total in there. Um, they generate about $425,000 annual in percent gross revenues. Uh, those revenues are self-reported by the leasees at the end of the fiscal year. Um, July 1st um, is when, between July 1st and July 30th is when they need to report to us. And if they owe any additional rent above their minimum rent, that's when they pay. Um, we've historically <coughs> audited every five years, although there was a big gap before I started as Harbor Director, about half a dozen of those sites every five years. Um, never until um, Lori and I took it on and it ended up proving to be auditing all 30 at once and we tried to audit three years worth. Um, even if we went to one year, I think it would have been too big of a thing to manage. Um, so putting together a, um, some kind of a cycle where we do them annually um, as opposed to trying to do all five years is what we think would work best. Um, every five years auditing one-fifth of the sites, that means about six sites and about 18 businesses are audited every year, much more manageable. Um, you know, we, we contract out to do those audit, audits with a CPA. It's not something we do internally. Um, with the new finance director, I'm under discussions with her and her staff to see what portion of the audits they may be able to do. We may be able to... Um, tie into the city's sales tax reporting data, which we get from uh, the state. So we may be able to do some of it in-house. Um, but the audit process isn't necessarily the hard part, at least not for us. You know, if we have a CPA doing it, it's the follow-up when, when anomalies are found and, and following up with leaseholders and making sure they're paying or, or doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's what gets harder to manage because it ends up being a lot of follow-up and a lot of letter writing and, and whatnot and bringing things to council if, if people are dragging their feet. So. Um, Doing six a year, about 18 businesses is much more manageable. Um, a couple of things I'm asking to have to think about tonight. Um, if you did six sites every year and you knew that you were a business and you were on year one and you had your audit done, now you know you're not going to be audited for five more years. Is that going to tend to um, create problems in terms of folks that may not report accurately? Um, so is there is it necessary to random kind of randomly through those sites every five years? Um, and if it is necessary, how the heck do you carry it out? Um, you know, you can you can do randomly to a point, but you know, if you're you're spinning the bingo wheel and then the five numbers pop out every year, the six numbers pop out every year, and and number six never pops out, how do you get to that? So um, something to think about, and then. Um, spoke about earlier a little bit about um, involving staff and, and 
trying to keep some of the process internal, um, comparing sales tax report to the Board of Equalization to present gross revenues um, as a spot check. Um, maybe do that annually, and then if any anomalies are, are noticed, you could um, queue those people up a little bit earlier. So um, what would constitute you know, something worthy of further investigation when it comes to sales tax versus um, percent gross revenue reporting? Okay, let's pull the board. Gene, this Eric, do le you lease, pull lease side audits. Pardon? Lease side audits. Yes, I know. Mm, sure. Well, it's for everybody, not just for you. Uh, Eric, do you find that there's a lot of, I'll use the word anonymous, anonymous very often? When we did all of our sites back in 2013, there was a number. A lot of them took some lot of time to get to the bottom of them, but they were explainable. If some people have more than one business location and, and more than one um, city, and the numbers got mixed up when we went to sales tax data. Um, it, looking historically at our at our percent gross audits, I, there were a f it seemed like every cycle there were a, a few people that underpaid, but none that I saw that were to a huge scale that was obvious, at least what I would call fraudulent. That all looked relatively normal. You know, the one thing that makes it a little more difficult to audit is that our percent gross runs on a fiscal year and everybody does their taxes and does all their reporting on an annual basis. So people, when they, when you get your taxes, you know, and when, when the auditor looks at your tax returns, they've got to take two years with the tax returns and split them and figure out how that spreads across those two years. So that doesn't make it any easier. And that's where some of those anomalies may lie is things like that. So what, so just to review what we're being asked to provide staff with input about is three things right now as it relates to audits. Frequency, the issue of calendar tax reporting as opposed to fiscal gross, as to fiscal gross, uh, gross sales reporting, and what constitutes an abnormality or an anomaly or whatever that might be. That's what we're being asked to address. Anything else, Gene? Okay, Jeremiah? No. Lynn? If the fiscal year as compared to the calendar year is a problem, wouldn't it be easier just to reduce it to the calendar year and use tax returns when they're simplified and more comparable? Yeah, I'll accept that our leases are, are structured on the fiscal year. Change the structure. <laughs> Anything else? Lynn? No. Okay. Mark? When a lease is, is undertaken, is it undertaken taken for the single year or the previous five years or from the previous audit or three years previous or what is the term of that that's undertaken? When I when when we did audits in 2013, we went back three years because they hadn't been done in ten. My understanding that is the legal statutory limit that we can go back and ask. So that's why we went to three years. Normally and historically, we've just gone back to the, the immediate past fiscal year. Mm -hmm. But there's not a limitation within the lease that says you can only. No. Yeah. No. We could, if we went and audited a given leaseholder and said, okay, Fred, it's time you're, you're being audited this year, we could audit the immediate past fiscal year or the leapfrog two years back or leapfrog three years back. And that may be a way to get at the randomness part of it. Is well, you may know your lease, you may know your audit's coming up in 2019. You don't know if it's going to be on which of three fiscal years. Just to start with, yeah, because you could you escalate work, that audit. It works yeah. once. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I still like the bingo wheel. You know, your number pops out. <laughs> that makes it really random. Anything else? Dana. Yeah, that makes it random until you get to the last five <laughs> leases. Yeah. Then they know. Yeah. But um, so, I mean, is there any unfairness to just, like, say you do uh, uh, 
an audit and then you know a year or two years later you do an audit on that same one i mean if if you see anomalies or you see anything that i mean is there an unfairness in that there's there's nothing in the leases that would preclude us from auditing somebody every year in the leases themselves the leases just say you shall be subject to periodic audit and you have to give a certain amount of information um, the unfairness part i suppose somebody could claim they were being picked on but if there's you're doing it for a reason and you know they they had a problem one year okay well, we're gonna out you next year to make sure you've, you've got it figured out this time and then it happens again it happens again i could see cause for multiple audits i i, I don't i don't see the i don't get that unfairness thing i mean they're yeah. in they're they're in business yeah they're supposed to be keeping records for their own benefit for the irs and for the state and for the city i don't see the unfairness issue either, okay. you, either you got your records or yeah. you ain't got your records so sharice oh, wait, I oh i'm sorry dana Go and ahead. then the second part of that is uh what constitutes an abnormality worthy of further investigation i think you already i guess low sales compared to other businesses i mean without a remodel going on or some other thing that might close them down for a time i mean you seem to have a grasp on this already mm -hmm. as far as this stuff goes from what i can see our leases themselves when it comes to under reporting and laurie and hopefully will jump in if i'm wrong and i probably will be something going from memory but our leases themselves say that if you've under reported between zero and I want to say 5% or is it 3%? I think it's 5%. If, if you're within 5%, you just owe the difference and we'll call it good. Oh. If you're between 5 and 10%, you owe us the difference and we're going to whack a little penalty on you. But it's not a big one. And if you're over 10%, it's like now we're coming down on you. We're going to assess a bigger penalty and you owe, you owe us for the cost of the audit and any legal services and everything else. So in that sense, it's kind of spelled out in the lease in a way it, it anticipated 5% was sort of the normal range of statistical what do they call it something rather okay Therese well, anything that I have to add, we're going to talk about in the LPUG. And, um, Say that again. <laughs> the what is lease. It? What's the acronym? <laughs> LPUG. Nice. Lease management policy update nice. process. Okay. Or group. Um, but uh, we have talked about um, different ways to audit, and I'm in favor of. Um, of requesting the forms that they have to fill out quarterly. Um, it's, it's pretty easy and it will actually even give a, another schedule that shows um, where the location is of where it is. And it just, I think it would um, remedy a lot of the costs associated with um, an audit process and keep them audit, uh, honest when they actually give their document that they fill out quarterly. It'll be included in the sheet that they do at the end of the um, year and therefore be easily read and understood without um, without bringing up without having to force things and um, getting the the tax documents um, when they do a, a yearly schedule C or whatever um, form that they fill out for the end of the year it's very convoluted there's a lot of extraneous information that we don't need to pay a lawyer to go through so I'm I'm for just trying to find the easiest streamlining audit process to lessen the time that that harbor advisory or harbor has to deal with it or pay for someone else to do so um, hopefully we can work on on that in LPUG. Anything else? No, thank you. I like the quarterly idea. I think that's a very wise idea. Um, if a business is operating normally, it's already reporting sales, as Sharice just said, it's already reporting sales tax on a quarterly basis. And, there, and that would seem to provide an opportunity to resolve the calendar issue for you because there's 
I don't think it's unreasonable to ask a business to provide its uh, uh, percentage gross sales information on a quarterly basis. A matter of fact, it's much easier to do it on a quarterly basis than on an annual basis. And I see a business owner nodding your head down at the end of the table. So that's, that's one thing. No. Uh, so insofar as frequency, you asked us to address three, uh, three things. Frequency, um, my thoughts are that initially, professionally audit all the sites that have not been audited in the past 24 months. That's just to open up the, open up the box on the process because we're already behind right now. Then uh, establish a policy to professionally audit every, every site every three years. I don't think five years works. I don't think it's reasonable for either party, either the city or the leaseholder. Beginning with one third of all sites, those would be sites A, one year following the initial audit, and the next third, sites B, one year after that, and the remaining third, sites C, one year after that, and repeat the process. Select the sites to address one of your uh, concerns. Select the sites on an as-needed and or random basis even if it means a given site is audited in back-to-back -back years. It's okay. But in no case, less than every three years. Regarding the randomness thing, that's a good point. Uh, it can be resolved with an algorithm. It's done all the time. Just plug in the thing and spin. It, it's a way of spinning the dial, actually. Just what you said, only it's something that's a little more controllable and predictable. For you, controllable and predictable. Uh, considering the issue of calendar sales reporting as opposed to fiscal gross sales, I like Sharice's idea. That's a great idea. Um, what constitutes an abnormality, my thinking is, uh, having had lots of businesses, my thinking is not more than a 2% variance. Um, uh, and comparative reporting, I like that concept as well. You folks have a lot of experience, and the businesses are actually, many of them are very similar. Maybe not in terms of their gross revenue so much, but in what their operations are. So again, it's a little mathematical task. Um, but you also just got done describing for us, uh, Mr. Director, that you have an existing step process. And that, what you described, sounded quite reasonable. Anything else on lease site audits? Gene. Just how much does an audit cost? The last one that we did in 2013, I don't know for the previous ones that were done before I started in this seat. We put it out to bid, you know, something contracting went out to bid and I think the total ended up being in the neighborhood of 50,000. For how many sites? That was for all 30 sites yeah. going back three years. That yeah. was in, 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 too many. in anticipation of, of uh, some portion of the city objecting to the, to the cost, it's the cost of doing business. It is a normal and customary cost of doing business. And over a period of time, you're going to have to build it into your lease rates or you shouldn't be in the lease business. That's not directed at the Harbor Department. Not taken as such. Good. <laughs> Anything else on the lease site audits? Getting, stepping off my soapbox. Okay, Eric, Mark? I have one other follow on. You mentioned that the, during the 2013 cycle where you undertook auditing all of the sites for the entire period, that it wasn't as much of an onus for doing the audits themselves, but it was more of a effort with regard to the enforcement and collection thereof. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a fair amount of upfront work we had to, because the auditor had never worked with the city on these particular types of audits before. They'd done, I think, TOT and some other audits. So there's a, a fair amount of work, and mostly on, on Lori's part, getting the leases and all the percent gross data and getting them all the paperwork. Once they went to work on it, it was fairly hands off. They came back to us occasionally and, and needed us to step in. And, you know, we had a couple of leaseholders that other subtenants 
didn't cooperate and provide information that they're supposed to, so we had to step in and provide a little muscle and try and keep that process moving forward. And then, you know, they reported back to us periodically and updated how things were going. But once they put the whole thing together, and it, it came in pieces, you know, it didn't come in one big report and they did, here it is, you know, it was, it fed in over a period of time. But, reckon, you know, they still had some sites that they didn't have great data on. They have had some anomalies that took a while to reconcile. Some of them were for dual sites. Some of them addresses were just wrong. Um, from the financial records either we had or even with the county or the BOE. Um, and then when we had ones that needed true follow-up and we finally got to the bottom, okay, you know, this one underpaid, then writing the letters and following up and making sure they paid, it was voluminous. It was a lot for just Lori and I to handle. Do you feel that if this was done more of a cycle type of format that you probably would avoid a lot of that oh, yeah. headache in the oh, yeah. you know, around like I said, we, year we, two. We took on all 30 leases and for three years. And so, you know, you, you, you had to report on any given lease site, and then you had it broken down into three years and what the numbers were, and it, it was just too much data, too much to to deal with all at once. And, and yeah, that's why we're proposing to do it on a cyclic basis. Thank you. Yep. And just be auditing every year. All the time. Okay, next part. Next. <laughs> the lease site inspection, similar to the audits. Uh, lease policy says we'll inspect our sites every five years for um, sufficient maintenance of improvements. Um, council wants to take it a step further and not just look at maintenance of improvements, but um, overall lease site operation, um, compliance with permit conditions. You know, every site has a conditional use permit on it that says, you know, the building operates as a restaurant and can seat this number of people and has all the normal conditions that every site has. And compliance with all those um, permit type conditions and, and other operations of the site in terms of compliance with the law. Um, cleanliness and whatnot. Um, so looking at trying to figure out how to do a process much like auditing and, and do it cyclically and, and inspect all of our lease sites. Again, historically, we've inspected them every five years. And historically, we've used personnel from the fire department. And they've done primarily a safety and the stuff the fire guys normally look at. Um, fire hazard things, sprinklers, electrical safety, storage. You know, uh, certain things can't be stored with this certain distance from the roof, you know, on shelves and whatnot, ceiling. Um, so they focus mostly on things like that. It wasn't necessarily structural deficiencies or um, I would kind of look at it akin to, you know, when you buy a home and you, you have a, a person come and inspect it and look and see what the deficiencies might be. Much the same as a, a home, you could do the same thing on a commercial lease site. Uh, but ours have always focused on more life safety issues. Um, and the other things that may have stood out that um, weren't life safety, but obvious things. They didn't do anything structural. They didn't do anything really maintenance-wise. Um, so looking at creating a more manageable site inspection program that's a little more thorough. Um, and again, um, as Ron says, it may take some money because it may have to hire somebody to come do some part of this. Um, so looking at... A program, if you do it cyclically, you know, over three years or five years, um, if you did it over five years, again, it'd be about six businesses, about about 18, six lease sites and about 18 individual businesses. Uh, if you did it every three years, obviously that would mean more um, per year. Um, what about contracting the professional commercial inspector for the basic maintenance and repair and upkeep issues? Um, and maybe stick with the life safety, safety issues inspected by the city's fire marshal. The city should be. Most cities aim to inspect all their businesses annual. Their fire inspector, that's one of their duties, is to, to do all those inspections. We haven't had a full-time fire inspector until very recently. Um, and it actually got funded out of um, plan checks and inspections that they do that they charge for. Um, so we do have uh, Matt Vieira, here's our fire marshal. Um, so the, the notion of um, our fire marshal doing annually the um, life safety and fire stuff and have a, a contractor do the maintenance repair and upkeep issues and then um, 
code enforcement type things referred to city's code enforcement officers um, and then you'll spot check so these are just some of the ideas I'm throwing up on the wall and see if I can get some Harbor Advisory Board input on these okay Sharice Dana Nothing. Uh, about inspections as far as you have you have somebody doing uh, the city fire marshal uh, and then do we have code enforcement yeah officer yep. Yep. Okay. they're part-time so maybe both of those guys i mean if there's code issues then we'll see up and obviously you're going to get the safety aspects of the fire marshal uh, and i think it might be a good idea if you have a checklist Some, some of these sites are going to be not applicable. Some of them. Oh, shit. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I think uh, possibly a checklist might be a good idea, also. That's my. Thanks. Mark? Well, looking with a contracting with a professional commercial inspector, it, it almost appears to. Be a step below having a professional property manager for the entire Embarcadero. Maybe a, a, a different method of accomplishing the same thing, where they'd be in a way earning their keep. You know, having the spot checks or the checks that we are interested in as a landlord will go well and above life safety issues and. Um, basic maintenance issues in that we're looking for if you think of our, our facility or our area as you would the mall you know a commercial mall who has concerns with how their property is being utilized how the entire area looks in addition to each individual shop how they're presented is there frayed carpeting is there have they repaired it with duct tape that's probably unacceptable in any mall location or any general retail location that is being managed as a percentage of gross lease or gross income. So the inspection that either a fire marshal or a code enforcement person would do while is critical in with regard to that role is not the kind of inspection that would be done by a professional property manager who is in part and parcel partnershiping with this individual for the gross income is a portion of their gross income. Uh, that's where I see that a you know a somebody that's going to be have both the time and the ability to spot check on an ongoing basis to maintain things in a professional manner that they're very familiar with in terms of a professional property management uh, standard would probably be something worth pursuing in terms of seeing if there's a benefit over and above whatever the expense may be. It, would, it makes the lease sites a little different. It's an interesting, the mall concept. Um, we don't own the buildings. The, the, we basically have turned them over to the master leaseholders to do that. They're the mall managers. They're the ones that are supposed to be keeping up on that the day-to-day, -day, the month-to-month, -month, the year-to-year. -year. How do we, the question is, how do we look over their shoulders to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing without doing their very job? Because I don't want to get into their job. That's what they own the lease site for. That's what they're getting paid for. That's what they get rent for. Unless you have provisions in the master lease, you don't have, you don't have anything to say. So that's something to be considered the lease in your working group is you, have, you would have to include in your master lease form some some provision for that or like i said you don't you got nothing to say the leases stipulate that the leaseholders need to maintain their sites to normal business stand i'm paraphrasing normal business standards and upkeep things and maintain and do all everything under the law they're supposed to do so that we do have that hook in them mm -hmm. They are required to maintain. Hmm. Might be worthwhile. I, I'm. Thank you. I'm. You're right. I'm aware of that it might be worthwhile to 
of the working group take a look at that language. Yeah. Okay. Anything else, Mark? Lynn? Jeremiah? Gene? Yes. We just, I believe last year, just did a structural analysis of every lease site with a 1 to 20 year recommendations on repair and maintenance. Um, I, I don't have any problem doing, or you guys having um, six reviewed every every year. I think that's probably a good selection. It doesn't necessarily have to be random. It could just start at one end of the the, the uh, Barcadero and go all the way through because we've just done the five-year uh, structural analysis. But I do like uh, Dana's idea of a checklist, um, and you mentioned conditional use of a permit. So that would be one thing that'd be on the on the list. Was yeah, are they are they a restaurant when they say they're a restaurant, or are they selling, you know, knickknacks or something like that? Yeah. So that's my comment. Yeah. You're correct. I don't think that the randomness part is is as important in this. It's, yeah. If something's deficient, something's deficient. You can't yeah. hide that out of randomness. Um, Eric, before we wrap this up, this item up. Uh, I was unaware, shame on me, that there had been a five-year structural review of all of the lease sites last year. So what we did, and I'll, I'll correct that a little bit, um, out of that seawall failure on the boat yard, we were concerned about everybody's seawalls and... Um, major structural components over the water. The leases stipulate, most of them stipulate, and it's not very good language in our, in our new lease template. Once we get that up, it's going to change. The leases stipulate that the leaseholders, and again, I'm paraphrasing, um, shall perform periodic maintenance surveys of their seawalls and revetment and major over the water structural components. Uh, doesn't say how often, doesn't say by whom, doesn't say what it is. It just says, a ma I think it says maintenance survey, which is kind of really nothing. Um, we went in after that seawall failure, and we probably did this in uh, 2000, started in 2016, wrapped it up in 2017. Um, went into all our leaseholders and said, we have no record of you having ever done this periodic maintenance inspection. We want you to provide us with one, or if you've done one recently, let us have it. Some leaseholds that had recently um, been majorly rebuilt, like uh, Anderson Inn, where they had full engineering done on their seawall and everything, and, and that's relatively fresh. We could accept things like that. Some of them hadn't done anything, and so they hired um, one of a few different entities to go do that kind of work, and we require them to have somebody qualify, an architect or engineer that's qualified to look at that kind of stuff, look at that. Um, so those were all done. I think they've finished up sometimes in, in 16 or 17, and I'm still following up on, talk about management, I'm following up on the results of some of those. But that was just on the seawalls, revetment, and water, major water structural type things, like, you know, something Great American Fish Company that's hanging over the ocean on top of pilings. Well, I was aware of that. Um, did that did that include all of the structure, all of the and I'll use the word advisedly foundation structure that over for all of those buildings that overhangs the water? Yes. Having been underneath some of those buildings in the last few months, that's, that's interesting. And they were all required, if they had deficiencies, to come up with a plan to repair. Some of them have been repaired. Some of them are underway. Associated Pacific, for example, is getting permits to do theirs. Roses is getting theirs underway. Harbor Hut did some stuff. Everybody's... They're all over the map on where they are in progress, but they're all. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Before we leave this, anybody, anybody else? Lease site inspections? So here's some thoughts. 
annually fire life safety code and permit operations performed by qualified personnel every six months building and grounds cleanliness via city staff every three years basic repair and maintenance to include over water structures conducted by qualified professionals Five years doesn't get it for me. The environment is too harsh. Too harsh. As Dana said, corrosive. So one of the things that it is is corrosive. As five years doesn't get it for me. That's just a personal opinion. Not speaking for the board. Okay, anything else on this before we move on? Uh, are you, you say moving on to the next item or just, right. I, I just have a question. Are there going to be other aspects of this policy that are going to be gone over, that we're going to go over? Or? Yes. Yeah. Okay. These I was looking two at the calendar. I, I just wanted to get a jump start on. Cause just these two items. Yeah, the, yeah, you'll be seeing more definitely, like I said, the, as needed as we work through this process and get the working group up and running. Um, occasionally we'll come back here if there's decision points or questions and whatnot to run by the whole board, yes. Okay, well the reason I ask is because we just went over 15 lease sites that are coming up and four or five of them are gonna have hotels where there weren't hotels on the water. And uh, that seems a little out of the general policy of this lease management. Make that point again, I didn't follow you. Okay, we just, in your staff report, you went over about 15 lease leases that are coming up, being renewed or yeah, okay. remodeled or right. anything. And about four of those are changing to or adding rooms, suites, yep. Hotel. hotels, yep. somewhere there was possibly marine related businesses. And I'm wondering how our working waterfront language is going to be incorporated in the future or at the present, more likely. Because looking at this agreement, the existing one, it's pretty specific. Uh, regarding that on in this area so that's why I was asking are we going to be going over these other aspects of this and uh, beyond just the audits and inspections yeah there's a there's, there's probably a dozen categories that the lease policy is going to be addressing um, from fair market rent to approved uses to these maintenance and inspection. Uh, there's, they say there's a dozen of them. Um, kind of falls into the approved use category, what you're referring to. Well, the overarching. Um, the big picture. The, the, over, the overarching requirement is, is are the very loosely defined words in the title of grant. Uh, correct. It's, will actively work with an attempt to enhance marine dependent or marine related uses in compliance with adopted sea plans policies. And then also, um, Prospective buyers of leasehold interest are buying the existing lease agreement. So I found that very interesting when I was reading through this because there's a lot of changes that go on. So they're buying the lease agreement, but it's not the same. Or they're changing it when they're when they're making they're making a whole new lease agreement. So I don't know, there's there's a lot of information in here that just general policy stipulating uh, you know supporting the Thailand's visitors serving but also um, 
maintaining a small commercial fishing harbor and working waterfront is uh, the city's goal. Mm -hmm. My recommendation for your consideration is that you arrange a meeting with the two Harbor Advisory Board representatives on that working group, because that's entirely within the provinces of the Brown Act, and, and um, share with them your thoughts. That, that, okay. That, that gives you, that, and my point being, Dana, that gives you potentially a direct pathway into the process. Thank you. Because your concerns are entirely legitimate and worthwhile. Both of you guys, no, right? Yeah. Okay. So before we close this out, um, I, I would appreciate it if uh, if first Sharice and then Mark share with the, with the board a little bit about your involvement and you know what your experience has been to date and what your thoughts are. Just give us you know give us five minutes or three minutes or two minutes or. Um, well, during the meeting, um, we talked about um, gathering information vital to actually making the decisions. I think that um, to get a lot of the information from similar areas on the California coast with similar uh, environments and uh, property, uh, that would be the most advantageous to um, base our, our decisions on. Uh, also, my concerns primarily at this time with uh, any changes that we might look into for the change as far as the um, template for leases would be to have more detail on the maintenance of lease improvements um, based on just general upkeep, just having it, it more spelled out so they're both informative for the actual master leaseholders, the subleases, and then they're also enforceable. So it's not um, something that you're like, oh, well, now you're telling me, or why was I not informed that I needed to have this accomplished? Um, just a little bit more than just kept up. I like the idea of a checklist. That's a, that's a new addition that I think as long as we all know what it is that we're responsible for, then you can come and say, hey, you signed up for this, so let's, let's work on that. So I'm in favor of trying to find that checklist for all uh, leaseholders, and it's beneficial to everybody in the building as well as the community that gets to enjoy that building. So um, we'll work on that. And then as far as one of the other topics that's important to me is the lease extension policy that is in place and will have future effects. Um, a lot of the leases that are coming up with like Pipkin and other things that the buildings are starting to decrease in their appearance primarily because they're going to either get a super huge facelift or they're going to be completely uh, demoed and rebuilt. It would be nice to have some kind of policy in there that's understood that keeps the buildings looking nice throughout the entire existence of the building, which helps all the people renting as well as all the businesses surrounding, um, making them feel like we're still a, a, a very positive area and not just all going downhill. Um, so I wanted to work on a lot of that as far as expectations because as a master lease holder, if you were given 50 and then you have 10 years remaining, what's the incentive to make it um, nice? So it would be um, good to have an understanding of what the future brings so everybody wants to work on their properties for their entire lease existence. Um, then also streamlining the auditing process um, to lessen the financial burden of the harbor funds. We uh, talked about the, the way that they could audit. Um, I know that of the money that, as a small business, that I give to the harbor department goes to what I would want uh, as, a, as something that helps the actual harbor. Uh, and it's upsetting to know that a large percentage of my money for that year might go to auditing me. <laughs> so it would be nice that, um, one, it didn't cost a lot. Um, two, that it really um, was uh, a delineated um, thing that was easy to understand. 
um, on both sides uh, as far as expectations of what you're going to get audited rather than just saying, hey, give us five years of your um, bank statements and you know, it, it's it's a daunting thing to have all that information requested. So if we could just pinpoint everything, so it's um, it's an easier process. Uh, I would like that my money would be going towards other um, needed resources rather than the auditing process. So I'd like to be a part of making sure that that's an efficient task that um, that gets results, actual results. Because I feel like the last one that was. Um, that happened. It was, it was just a cost rather than actual um, generating any kind of change in the people that were getting audited, or um, you know benefiting the harbor department in in increased revenue from that time period, over and above the fifty thousand that it cost. So that's what we're working on. And thank you. Thank you, Sharice. Mark. Well, I'm looking forward to working on a, on a broader base as well. And we've got a couple of city council members and uh, city staff that are going to be joining as well into the committee. And as such, we'll get a, a broader view and a, a good idea of uh, all the aspects that we should be addressing within the leases and what our policy should be. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I know that... Um, Ms. Callaway, our uh, city's finance director, is well aware of all this. She's a really smart, sharp lady, uh, but part-time help. I have a CPA. I don't pay him to do my books. There's all kinds of very experienced and talented people for 25 bucks an hour who, I, who can crunch my numbers. Doesn't have to be full time staff. Okay, anything else on this particular item? No, no, good, thanks. That's good, thank you. Okay, C5. C5 is an update on the public information forum held by Trident Wind. It was actually Castle Winds, but I'm sure the Harbor Director will tell us all about that. That uh, took place on October 11th of this year. Eric? So, thank you. I'll just give a brief overview. But yes, Trident Wind is um, now team. Trident Wind still exists, um, but they've now partnered with the company ENBW. It's a German power company that's um, financing, I think, a, a good deal of their project. And now they've renamed themselves Castle Wind, although apparently California State Parks has a problem with that because of Hearst Castle. And it's in view of Hearst Castle. So. They're working that out. So on October 11th, um, Castle Wind, Trident Wind had a public information forum at both their recreation and community center. Uh, it's pretty darn well attended. Um, they basically gave an overview of the, the BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management leasing process. Um, which in, in, is very complicated and convoluted and long. The basic next steps that are coming up is they, they put out what's called for call for areas. Um, they've identified three areas, one off Morro Bay, actually two off Morro Bay, they call it the Morro Bay North, Morro Bay South, and then one off of Humboldt somewhere up on the North Coast. And they basically say, um, hey world, we're thinking about leasing these three areas. Uh, give us your input on whether or not we should lease them and how we go about it. So that's out on the Federal Register right now. Um, once that commenting period ends, um, BOEM will then um, put them out to competitive bid and invite folks to put the actual bids in, which is when Trident will apply, uh, or Castle will apply. Apparently there's two other companies that are interested as well. Um, and then it goes through a competitive leasing process. Uh, the, two directions that process can go is um, one, strictly to the highest bidder, or two, um, a, a bid process that takes into, other takes into account other factors beyond just the highest bid. Um, things like um, agreements with commercial fishermen or local communities or economic impact analysis that have been done. Um, 
the other things that the, the proponents are um, proposing to, to do and engage in as part of the process rather than just offering up the highest dollar amount. Um, Castle is, is hoping for the latter and that they've worked with the city extensively on, on a community benefit agreement that I'll get into and they've worked extensively with the commercial fishermen's organization. I'll let Jeremiah jump into when we get to that point. Um, and so there's a company that, that is apparently throwing its hat in the ring, Stat Oil, which has now changed its name and I can't remember what it is, but it's something completely different. Equinor. That's it. Um, they can probably outbid Castle pretty handily, and so they're hoping that the, the other factors get factored in. Um, Area-wise, um, the area they're looking at, they, they're moral bays of interest because we've got the power plant, we've got the tie to the power grid that is there regardless of the power plant operating or not. Um, so they want to be as close as possible to that, um, yet be out in the windy zone 20 miles offshore. They're basically 20 miles straight off Cambria, kind of hugging the bottom of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary boundaries. Um, the, the, one of the biggest issues they have in this area is that Department of Defense claims a lot of the land, no, not a lot of land, a lot of the water out there. Uh, if you look at a map of, of DOD's interests, um, Navy, Air Force, Marines, um, it's extensive. Um, they've got training areas, they've got testing areas, they've got all these different zones, um, they've got flight corridors, all of which were established and have been used long before um, environmental impact analysis were done, analyses were done, in other words, before NEPA existed. And if they change any of those things drastically, they've got to go through the NEPA process and they really don't want to do that. They want to keep their existing corridors and therefore they're very limited on the zones that they will want a wind farm to be sitting in, mainly because of their flight training with the Navy and those that do, um, well, others, not just Navy, but Air Force as well, um, because their corridors are very limited and strict and, and they go inland a little more and all the Navy you know, bases and, and military bases. So. They're working with DOD. The short, I guess, the short story on it is, is, is um, Bohm and and these project proponents are working with DOD to try and come up with a compromise that DOD can live with in terms of an area that they can lease. And it looks like they're narrowing in on that same zone. They're morphing its shape and size a little bit. Um, but once they get that worked out with DOD. I think then, and after this call area um, goes out, call for the areas goes out, they'll start putting things out to bid. Um, Time-wise, uh, two to three years out probably for that process to start occurring. Um, and then Castle's project um, is for about 30 units to start. Eventually they'll ramp up to I think near 100. Um, Again, tying into the grid here, um, the hook that, um, for us in terms of the Harbor Fund goes is they want to use the outfall conduit, the old outfall tunnel that the power plant used to run its hot water out to run their wire back in because you know, digging through the beach and, and putting in electrical line um, can be costly. So they've already got some conduit in the ground. Plus, they'll have to cross city property. So um, we'll be working with them. We have been working with them closely on a community benefits agreement. They basically um, want the city to enter into an agreement that we will lease that conduit to them or that outfall to them if they win the lease site or if they win the Boehm lease, um, certain other stipulations. Um, you can't really talk too much about because we're in negotiating, negotiations with them. Um, council wanted Castle to get an agreement with the commercial fishermen because we know this would affect the commercial fishermen. They've done that. Um, we, they also asked for an economic um, impact analysis. Um, Castle did that. That was put in a staff report, I think, that I brought to Council a month or two ago. Um, so that's kind of where we are process-wise. Um, again, these are about 20 miles off the coast of Cambria, about 35, 36 miles out of here. Um, on your normal day, standing on the beach up in Cambria, Cambria you'd never see them. Um, standing up at Hearst Castle, maybe on a clear day. Um, we're all in the maritime world one way or another. As you know, the earth is 
got a curve to it, at least most people still believe it does. Um, and the, the apparent horizon from sea level is I think 12 or 14 miles. So these things being 700 feet tall, while they're over the horizon, they'll be sticking up above the horizon. But once you get up high, like at Hearst Castle or even Cambria, some of the houses up on the hill, you may be able to see them. They will be lit. Um, obviously for navigational purposes, they may be lit by keying a radio microphone, uh, much like some airports are. You, you tune the airport common frequency and you key the mic three times and it turns all the runway lights on. They may be like that so that the, the light impacts are minimized, but that's all stuff they're gonna work out. Um, Castle brought in several um, photographic renditions where they went up to Hearst Castle and took photos day and night and then superimposed what they believe the, um, what these units would look like. Again, daytime on a very clear day, you can kind of see a little white line out on the horizon. Nighttime, red lights going off, you'd see the little red lights on a clear day. Most days, especially in you know, spring and summer, if it's windy, there's going to be so much haze on the water, you're never going to see them. But they're still impacts. And then you know, they'll have to go through the whole NEPA process with environmental impacts and go through Coastal Commission and all, of, all the regulatory bodies under the sun are going to have a say in this process. And that's my story. Before we go that, uh, two things. I, I took some notes, some of, um, and the public, those folks who are listening might be interested in some of this information, perhaps not, and then uh, we're gonna, we'll conclude the staff. Jeremiah's got his stuff We'll too. conclude the staff report with Jeremiah talking about the Commercial Fishermen's Organization, and then we can open it up to questions. Uh, so this is them talking. This is this is uh, the uh, Castle Winds folks talking. This isn't me talking. This is things that they that they points that they discussion points that they brought up. Wind turbine structure foundations, which are attached directly to the ocean floor, are not currently practical in water depths of more than approximately 300 feet. And they were talking about water depths of six to 900 feet in the proposed site. So water depths greater than approximately 300 feet require floating structure, te floating structure technology, which they re represented to us it presently exists. It didn't some not too long ago, but it does now, and it's anchored to the seabed. Uh, there are very limited wind farm site opportunities on the California Central Coast, uh, principally due to, as Eric said, Department of Defense training issues. This is not the case in Northern California. So this isn't the only possible site on the, on the coast of California. And if things get too, uh, the, the representative sort of suggested, and maybe I misinterpreted, that if things get a little too dicey down here, it's going north. Uh, DOD issues are profound and potentially restrictive relative to the farm site location and size. And I read that as being a principal concern of theirs at this point. 33, this is still them, all of this is them talking. 33 different regulatory agencies plus environmental groups have to be satisfied concerning a given site as well as satisfied with the site plan. For Castle Winds, the goal of this process is, quote, agreed access, end quote, for a site. In addition to Castle Winds, the Norwegian company, Eric talked about this, uh, Equinor and one other, Operator formally expressed an interest in the Central California site to BOEM, the Bureau of Ener Ocean Ener Energy Management, uh, potential wind farm site. Now, I must have misunderstood this, Eric. Uh, I thought she said potential wind farm sites will be auctioned off by the federal government this month. That that's, must be incorrect. That's just no. my note. No, so. I don't think. Okay. No, I don't think so. Right. So, although BOEM auction application and, and um, the all through the BOEM auction application and auction process, the public has repetitive opportunities to comment, but it's up to the public to track it. Current California state law requires 60% of all electricity sold in the, state of, in the state to come from renewable energy, quote unquote, and 40% to come from, quote, low emission sources, end quote. That's a pretty profound concept right there. From Hearst Castle to the first row of turbines. Hmm? From Hearst Castle to the first row of turbines and the proposed Central Coast wind farm site is approximately 30 miles. So she said. Castle Winds joint venture envisions using Morro Bay as a service harbor if the Central Coast farm site comes to fruition. 
The present concept, their present concept is to use the power plant pump house as a converted service facility in one or two of the stacks as training facility and again communications antenna structure. So the stacks would still be with us. I, 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 did, I, actually, I actually asked her about that afterwards and she did not want to discuss that. <laughs> I can just see, you know, 120 foot blades whipping around down there. Yeah, you betcha. Also, uh, as, as Eric said, transmission line uh, bringing that through in the existing outfall. Uh, Castle Winds cannot at this time quantify any economic benefits to the city of Morro Bay. The project would first have to be permitted with the parameters of that project determining quantification of economic benefit. That's a quote. The permit process requires not less than two years and could be more. After permitting additional years, they weren't conclusive, or I didn't hear conclusive, perhaps Eric did, would be required to engineer the farm, shoreside facilities, install it all, and bring it online. So we're talking years, if it happens. And then the economic feasibility that you mentioned, is that the one that they commissioned with Cal Poly? Yes. Okay, and that is, that's done? It wasn't economic feasibility, it was an economic impact report, and it, it wasn't to the zip code level, it was regional, and it was a pretty broad brush stroke, but it was what they'd anticipate given their proposed project scope and scale now, if they had a, you know, a maintenance and, and administrative operational center here in the county, you know, hopefully Morro Bay for the, you know, the maintenance and the boats coming in and out, you know, administrative headquarters, you know, head of household jobs, that kind of stuff. They did an economic impact analysis. Im of that impact would. study. Yeah, well. Yeah. No, 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 that's a good word. So, yeah. as opposed to feasibility. Which yeah, is, it wasn't feasibility, it was an yeah. economic impact. Okay, thank you. Okay, good, thanks for that. And then, um, as Eric mentioned, and uh, Jeremiah can address if he so chooses, the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization and Castle Winds have reportedly negotiated a mutually benefit agreement, beneficial agreement. <coughs> Jeremiah, you want to talk about that? Yeah, um, one of the first things I would like to do is thank the city and the mayor and city council for, uh, so we had been in negotiation for three years long time and very tedious, a uh, very difficult project. Uh, and then uh, the, the city was uh, anxious for an agreement and they did hold off and hold off for quite a while while we formalized and were able they, to sign they the being agreement. The, they being the city or Castle West? The city. The city held held off on their support until the commercial fishing industry was satisfied. And that's uh, where we're used to the city always being very generous to us, saying, what do you guys need and what do you need? Well, usually the only thing we need is support. And in this case, they showed uh, a great deal of support. And again, I thank them for that. Uh, we did sign a... a contract with Castle Wind on October 6th during the Harbor Festival this year. Uh, so one of the reasons that we went after a contract with them was uh, it, it wasn't something we thought we could fight because the federal government is all over this uh, and wants wind power on both coasts, everywhere. There's an article here uh, about it, as a matter of fact. The Department of the Interior is looking for it. The state of California is looking for it. The county is looking for it. So to take on anything other than mitigation would, we felt, be a losing battle. So in any case, uh, Alan Weinstein, who is the founder and president of Trident Wind, approached us uh, three years ago and talked of co cooperation and mitigation. 
realizing the impact on our fragile fishing community. Al has partnered with a German power company, uh, ENBW. This combination has produced a corporation called Castle. So we've been negotiating with the, the two entities, Cast, or it was ENBW, now they formed Castle. So there's two corporations basically we're uh, involved with. And they've both been very forthcoming, realizing that we did have significant impact. This will involve uh, probably 100 square miles of immediate territory where the wind farm will sit. And we're not sure at this point how much uh, of an impact the lines will be on various forms of fishing, the power lines connecting the shore and the, the, uh, the farm. So they can impact a lot of different fisheries, particularly trawl fishery, uh, longline fisheries, and so forth. Um, we, we, the members of, of the Morro Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization uh, are proud of what we came out with. We believe it's uh, the first of any kind. It's, this hasn't been done before in the United States. And <clears throat> we are seeking information from Europe to see if they have ever been successfully mitigating <clears throat> with any of their many wind farms over there. But we think we are perhaps the first to have ever done this. Uh, we will be going to D.C. in December to talk to various groups from around the country, hoping that they will be able to use this as a template other fishing groups, excuse me, uh, for processes they'll be going through. Right now, the eastern seaboard, particularly in the northeast, are all in court, either state or federal or both, in regards to the wind projects that have been put in place, primarily without any input from the, the fishing industry. And uh, currently, they're trying to put one off Massachusetts and Rhode Island. That's a prime scallop area, which is a very significant fishery in, in the Northeast, particularly. Um, so anyways, the, uh, this project, I would like to point out, and most particularly, that the fishing industry now will be supporting in every way we can. As a matter of fact, uh, Tom Hafer and myself just met with our congressman the other day at his request to go over uh, the progress we've made with Castle Wind. And it's very, very important that uh, the city, the fishing industry, and other entities, anybody who can, support Castle Wind in this project. And the reason I say that is because the other two entities uh, involved with this have shown no interest in speaking with anybody. The Harbor Department, they talked to one time. The commercial fishermen, they've talked to one time. Uh, and uh, uh, the city, they talked to one time. And they have not been available for any further uh, conversation. This was two years ago that they got in touch with uh, our community, basically, and have shown no interest in our community since that time. That's uh, Stat Oil, who is now Equimore. I don't think we want, I think we want to ensure Castle is going to get the lease because I don't think we want to do business with Equimore, who has showed no interest in our community. Unfortunately, uh, and Eric, you mentioned, the, uh, the, there was a point system established to, so these leases go on the highest bidder. It's the highest bidder. But if you did work in the communities, or there was a, a point system to give you a certain amount of points towards this lease if you had put in the time and legwork in the communities involved and so forth. 
Uh, and Ella Weinstein has been working now, as I said, three years with the city, the county, the state, and the fishing industry. Uh, and they just did away with that point system. So, uh, unfortunately, all of the work that was done by them is now thrown out the window. Uh, the reason they did that was because they did award a lease, award a lease in the state of Massachusetts in which they disregarded that part of their their rules, and so now they feel because they didn't do it there, they feel they shouldn't do it anywhere now, which that's the way it is. So the point system is no longer being used, so it's going to take a lot of, uh, the, the congressman is going to try to get them to reinstall it and so forth, but that's, I don't think that's probably going to fly. Uh, yeah, the other outfit's a Dutch company, so Stad Oil out of Norway is the one other company, and there's another Dutch company looking into it. I think Stad Oil will probably the, be the biggest competitor, and both of these groups are very well funded, so it'll be a battle of who wants to, who's willing to put how much out, <coughs> excuse me, on the table. Um... So I did supply you with a, uh, a breakdown of our agreement, and uh, if anybody has any questions. Wait, hang on a second, hang on a second. Is that it? That's it. Okay. So comments or questions from the board? We're pushing nine. I'm not hurrying, I'm just telling you. So, Cherise? No. Dana? No. Mark? I want to thank you for your time and efforts. Yeah. Thank you. I, uh, I would like to point out, and I do appreciate that sentiment, that this was accomplished by the entire uh, officers and directors from Morrow Bay Commercial Fishing Industry. So, I thank you, and I would take that compliment. Over a three-year period of to, time. Over a three-year period. I'll take that compliment to the board because they, every single person was uh, equally involved. Lynn? Yeah, if they've thrown out the point system that uh, would affect the awarding of, of the lease, then how does your agreement with uh, Castle come into play? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks very much. As a matter of fact, I overlooked something I meant to say, Lynn, uh, or reiterate on, is it has nothing to do, that part has nothing to do with our, uh, our contract. Okay. Uh, although, again, I, I just want to reiterate that this contract is uh, probably going in the trash can if Castle does not win the, the lease. Then we'll be stuck with Stad Oil. And they, there's, again, this is the first time this has ever been done. No one's ever done this. So I, I don't see Stad Oil, particularly after they received the lease, being too uh, accommodating. Gene? Who awards the lease? The BOEM. So we can contact them and, and support the commercial fishermen and castle? Well, it's in, yes, yes. And it's not just to, to support the commercial fishermen, it's to support, uh, as I look at it, the city, the town, the community, because right. these are the people who have been working in and around our community and been very forthcoming. Uh, Okay. So, yes, Good. thank you, Jean. Yeah. Is BOEM aware of the agreement between the Moore Bay Commercial Fishermen's Organization and Castle Winds? You know, I don't know if they are aware of the signed agreement. I, I can't answer that. 
um, we have met together with BOEM and uh, they know that we were working on an agreement. Whether they know that we have signed the agreement, I imagine they do, only because this point system thing is relatively new. The fact that they're not going to be using it, it was kind of sprung on them. So they were informing BOEM of all of the inroads they were making in the community, thinking, of course, they were going to be getting points for it. So I'm, I'm just guessing, Ron, that they do. From the little, but we have we have we have wrote letter. We have letters ongoing with BOEM, uh, with uh, uh, Zinke, uh, Department of the Interior, and so forth. So. Yeah, from Gene. Wh uh, of the two bulb meetings I've been to, they continually talk about stakeholders being a part of the process. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. If it if it's real and not just bureaucratic talk, you never know. Uh, from what little I've read, uh, and I could be entirely wrong about my interpretation of this, this the point system seems to have been run, a, been victimized by uh, the legal complications on the East Coast. And it's kind of, and it strikes me as a knee-jerk reaction uh, to the legal complications over there. And I, I would hope that somebody, some stakeholder, I hate that word, but it's okay. I would that some stakeholder would point out to uh, to Boehm that uh, one way to avoid that kind of entanglement is to have a system in place that uh, takes all the stakeholders into account. Which is what you're, which is something you folks have been involved in, right? And there, you know, Ron, they just uh, developed a group on the East Coast. They're meeting this week, as a matter of fact, I think for the first time. And I'm trying to find it here, but it's uh, it's a group, an inclusive group for the Northeast. Currently, hopefully, it'll spread to the rest of the uh, the, the rest of the Atlantic Coast, but it's a, a group called RODA, and they're made up of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Jersey at this time. So hopefully that, uh, here it is, RODA, hosts a vineyard workshop on the 31st of October in Warwick, Rhode Island. So this is a uh, a group, a fishing group, that hopefully will begin this process. But, you know, this is a process that you've got to start before the leases are granted. Because once the lease is in place, dealing with the big corporation becomes certainly much more difficult, and your ability to deal is hindered because they've already got the lease. Okay, questions or comments? I think we're, are we any? I see any? Okay, seeing none. So, do anybody, do we have uh, any future agenda items that any board member would like to declare? Seeing none. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? None. Carries. Thank you for your time.